George Orwell once said that in a time of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Oh, how those words were only whispered when he first said it. But it's a trumpet blaring through a megaphone today. So are you ready to take a journey down a labyrinth of twists, turns, and dead ends as we seek out Wonderland? Join me every weekend for investigative live streams at twitch.tv backslash strange investigations. Interested in more organized and detailed content about the hard truths of the world? Then check out my content on YouTube by searching out William Rail or Strange Investigations. On Rumble, BitChute, and Odyssey by searching Strange Investigations. Lastly, the quick and easily digestible content is more your speed. You just can't get enough of my content. Check out my content on TikTok at Strange Investigations 1. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Murder of the Grey State, but we are going to do a little bit of a discussion tonight. Uh, with me tonight, I have Catherine and I have Sophia. Uh, thank you guys for Hi. joining me tonight. Thanks for having us. Oh, of course, anytime. Hello. All right, so the big question here is, I, I, I figure we might as well go over this. Um, what exactly does prove David Crowley guilty, if there is anything, really? Um... Is there anything you guys can think of proves David uh, Crowley guilty at all? I know I sure can't. No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Right, right. And I'm sure you guys get a lot of questions as well. Um, you know, or well, not rather questions, but people claiming, you know, such and such proves David Crowley guilty. Um, so what are your guys' thoughts on that exactly? Well, for me, it's like, it seems like uh, the people who state that David is guilty, they're using a biased opinion, and I have yet to see any facts presented. Well, fair point. Yes, exactly. All right. Well, uh, let's just start off with uh, just a few statements people like to go and say. Um, so the police reports state that David committed two murders and then killed himself. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Uh, I'm just saying that, well, I don't know. I mean, we've seen too much from the crime scene that disproves what the police reports state. Right. And I just, I didn't even believe the narrative when I watched the uh, the documentary for the first time and I hadn't even read the police reports at that time. Very good point. So, what about you, what I find, uh, Yeah, what I find interesting is that, and I've, I've heard this say, stated so many times, is the actual reports don't tell you anything. They eventually um, on, I think, maybe one or two, it'll say that they finally, you know, um, all along it's, you know, deaths and then um, homicides and then a possible murder-suicide. And then, well, okay, finally one point says on um, something that, okay, it's, it's a murder-suicide. But then they never give a reason as to why they came to that conclusion. Right, right. And that's the thing is, I mean, you know, all my research through it too, it's just exactly it. It's just, it, there's nothing in there that really shows that the police are saying, yeah, David's guilty. They're just essentially saying, well, we got nobody else. He's dead. Uh, you know, we're going to just kind of go with this, but you know, we're not really sure. <laughs> I mean, that's at least what I took from it. Yeah. And, and just, let her have, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sophia. No, I was just going to say, I just love how the police reports state that because there was no signs of struggle and uh, no forced entry, then David's guilty. Right. But they didn't even bother to look at anything else. And by the way, they didn't need to have forced entry when the back door was broken. Yep, it was, you know, even if they, you know, they, some people try to say, well, it was only a jar. It was only open a little bit. Well, it doesn't matter. It was unlocked and it was open. 
So you don't, like Sophia was saying, anybody would, in their right mind would go, well, you don't need forced entry. Well, the other interesting and part. certain people did admit that they knew that the back door had always been broken. Oh, really? Yeah. That, that's actually the first I've even heard of that one. Yeah, I believe that Greg can back that up, too. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Well, the one thing I noticed when looking, you know, if we look at the police reports, they... I mean, we all know they got a lot of information in there, just like, it's almost like it's messed up, you know. Uh, we had police statements, you know, from family and friends, and there was a bunch of, it comes down to credibility. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one of those things that they prove that they're not credible individuals in there, um, because either they're blatantly lying, or their memory is just that terrible. But... You know, you, you start cross-referencing these things with the other documents we've got, and then all of a sudden now the police reports, uh, these these uh, friends and family statements, a lot of them actually just kind of fall through the crack because they're just, it's not really something we can really use here. They're just kind of showing something opposite when we look through everything else. Right, and, and that's the thing that I, I don't understand because they did have, and they do have, the, the police that is, um, the cell phone records. They have copies of, you know, um, times when text messages were received and sent and phone calls received and sent. And it wasn't that difficult to match up the people who were saying that they had contact with David and compare that with the actual records that they had in their own possession. And you clearly see nothing matches up. These people, and, and so, Right away, like you were saying, it comes down to credibility, which then shows they're not credible. So why are they then using this as as a means to support the narrative? Absolutely. And the other other part I noticed too was um, they they even they're pretty blunt when they say, "Oh, this is a text message." Um, if there was anything about social media, they were very very straightforward. This was a social media post. That blah 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 blah. So they know the difference. So yes. if David got a mm -hmm. phone call or a text message. So they're saying that clearly it's a text message or it's a phone call, then they're they know the difference obviously. So they're they're saying it's quite literally this is a phone call or this is a text message that they've got access to that they've mm -hmm. but we look through the phone records and there's nothing there. There was no text message from Chris Peck. Um, you know, when it says Mason Hendricks had called David on they talked on the phone. Unless Mason Hendricks, but even then, you look at the phone records when it comes to December, was David really talking to a whole lot of people? Not really. So, did he actually speak to David on the phone? The answer is looking like a no, because if you go off their records, there's nothing there to even prove that Mason Hendricks actually spoke with David. So, exactly. there's more there too, so... All right. Well, I mean, yeah, so we can kind of see that the police reports are just kind of a uh, hokey. Um, <laughs> They are. Yeah. So we'll get the next question here. Well, actually, I was going to say something in regards to that. Sure. Uh, there are some people that have made excuses saying that, oh, they must have downloaded uh, free calling apps onto their phone. And I'm like, what's the point of that? <laughs> I mean, they could have done Wi-Fi calling from their home mm -hmm. with yeah. AT&T and their iPhones. Right. They could have had free long-distance call through that. They could have had it through Facebook, too, with, through Messenger. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is the point of downloading extra apps on a phone that you pay for? Right. I mean, they're not trying to hide anything from anybody else. Nobody else is paying their bill. Absolutely. Well, another thing, too, is so, with I mean, those blacklight reports, also, they were also giving us a lot of insight on what exactly they were using. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, we didn't see anything with any kind of free phone apps or any of this kind of stuff, which that would have shown what's up. What's app on there? Uh, which, the, which one? What's app? Yeah, the what's app. Is that on the blacklight? Uh, I believe okay. so. I need to go back and double check on that. Fair enough. All right. Okay. So you guys ready for the next one? Or do you want to just... Uh, yeah. Speaking of, okay. no, that's, that's fine. Perfect, perfect. 
All right, so the next one is David was drunk, and I know I just put and, but it, and or uh, high and eventually just snapped. What's your guys' takeaway on that one? <laughs> well, we're both well, going to say the same thing. His toxicology reports were clean. He, right? had, he was not, yes. and he was not high. <laughs> yeah, and plus, if you look at the journal, I mean, he's talking about drinking uh, back in the summer and how he doesn't like how it makes him feel. He said the same thing about the mushrooms and that he was quitting the pot. I don't think he smoked it after early fall, I think, what he was talking about in his journal. So, right. I mean, and you just don't see that proof. You see the pot there on the dresser, mm -hmm. but it wasn't being smoked at at the time. The canister was in the bathroom, all cleaned out and everything. Uh, it's not showing up in their system, and it would have. So I just, I just don't see that at all. I mean, you would have seen mention of the alcoholic beverages in the house if they had been in the house. I've seen other police reports from Minnesota that state that. Absolutely. And so <clears throat> I'm just not buying it. They took out the medications from the drawer. They put it there. I think the only reason why we didn't get an actual photo of the medications is because HIPAA right. and privacy. And I'm, I'm okay with that. Right. I don't want to step that boundary, but I mean, if there had been alcohol, I'm pretty sure we would have seen photos because that would have been proof, more right. proof for them. Right. And, you know, plus with the toxicology also showing, you know, what they, what they showed. I mean, he obviously wasn't high, nor was Kamel. All mm -hmm. they showed that she had like an aspirin or an ibuprofen in her system. And that was for pain relief, which we already knew she had. Um, I believe it was, uh, wasn't it like lower back or something like this problems? It was some like arthritis or something, but you know, she, she had mm -hmm. pain, you know, she was, she was using that for pain relief and I mean, it makes sense. I mean, well, and then when you're reading through the journal, yes, at the beginning, you know, cause he had only just, I think he stated he smoked pot for the first time when he was 28 and mm -hmm. they were what? 29 when they die, 28, almost 20. So it's not like he was a dope head. But what I found interesting is as you're reading it and you're going toward the end, just not too long before the, the last entry, he actually states that he's going to leave this stuff alone because it messes with them too much. And he didn't like what one of the times, I think it was the stuff, please don't quote me, but I, I think I remember it this way, that something he'd gotten from Chris oh, oh, during the summer. So this was earlier and he, it did something and he didn't like what it did to them. It messed with them so bad. It scared them. And so he's like, you know, I, I think I'm going to just kind of lay off of this stuff. And mm -hmm. that's why mm -hmm. I find it really interesting how all of a sudden Chris is like, oh yeah, he's, you know, saying he wants to come get some and their stuff on the dresser, but yet his toxicology is clean. It's, those are complete, they're opposites. Right. And it almost seems like that was planted at that point then. I mean, yeah. the thing is, if you look yeah. at it too, it looks a little dry. Um, and yeah. I know, you know, everybody's I mean, made a comment. Right. It's, that. it's pretty dry. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we'd have to look at, okay, well, how long does it take to go and dry? Uh, marijuana out, you know, like that, to the to the extent that that was dried out. That was like, that looked like, that was like, literally like brittle. It was starting to get a little brittle. So if that's getting a little brittle, it's not really, you know, that's just, that's no good. So, I guess we'd have to go and talk to somebody that, you know, you know, a connoisseur of marijuana, I suppose. Luckily, I'm in Oregon, so there's a lot of people here. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, in me being in Colorado, trust me, I had no problem showing that photo to so many people. Right. I mean, I, I don't care if people smoke it. I don't personally, but I don't care if people do, and I know a lot of people that do. Right. And I showed them the photo, and every single one was like, we would never do that. That's not how, no, that's not right. 
and they didn't know. I'm just showing them a photo and said, okay, tell me what you see of this photo and, and is this something that you ex you would have in your house? That's all I said. Mm -hmm. And they're all like, no. Right. And so it has to, I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, is I don't, I don't know if I really fully recall the whole uh, Chris Peck thing with the pop, but I know what you're talking about. I, I know what you're talking about on that, but, um, but I know there's something there too. Is, uh, I just don't, and once again, I don't want to be quoted either, but I'm pretty sure there's something there to that extent, what you were saying. Um, about yeah, I thought he had said he'd got it from, he'd picked it up from, from Chris Peck, but that's what I'm saying. Don't quote me on that part because right. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but he did state whatever that he and Kamel had smoked had really messed with them. And, and he did not like it. It, it right. like almost the, the feeling that was coming through the writing was it scared him. So he's like, okay, I'm backing off. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm which, not, this is not okay. Which that begs the question was at least that. As if he had right. some, you know, as if that he's got some thought. nice stuff. Not to mention, we had that, um, what was that? Uh, was it on the Gray Sage podcast? We had the one caller uh, discussing about the the trafficking like, um, network that goes through that area. So it's like, okay, well, I mean, that, you know, what's his face this isn't too far off from there. So, I mean, it wouldn't, wouldn't be outside the realm of was he involved with this? You know, not David, but uh, Peck. But. You know, I mean, especially as he's dealing in that state, it's not legal at that point, especially. So, um, right. you know, we're looking at, you know, what else is going on here potentially? And, you know, if he's not, if we don't have any of the text messages showing that David did actually text him and had this discussion, um, I know there's there's different, uh, um, different things that have, surfaced we I'm, I can't really say whether they're true or false at this point but there's different uh, different things that have surfaced trying to state that oh well you know this is proof that you know Chris Peck had had texted him but the thing is end of the day we got the phone records we can see there's there's a gap and there's nothing on the 19th so and especially not from Chris Peck there's nothing there right so yeah, and I don't see what's out on either Black Light Report. Yeah, fair enough. So, and it had connected to his iPhone, so it would have shown. Mm hmm Maybe it wasn't, I mean, it yeah. might not have been used. So, I mean, we don't, I mean, I don't yeah. know the full extent of, like, was it everything that was on their phone that they showed off, like all the apps? I, I mean, he's, I'm sure there was a ton of apps on there. Uh, most people usually have a ton of apps on their phone anyways, but, um, you know, so it's, are they only showing the ones that were in use within a certain time period? Are they showing all the apps in general? That'd be my question for the I'm not exactly APPD. sure. I'm still looking through it, but I'm not exactly sure. You're good. I did find something that goes with this call tonight. Hey, Greg, how's it going? I'll go over it. I sent you the link, so you are welcome to join in if you'd like. And I just wanted to let you guys know, I mean, the lunar eclipse is actually happening faster than what they told us to. I just looked outside, and it's almost complete, but it hasn't started to change color. So if I drop out, that's where I'm at. Oh, I get you. I'm outside looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll probably see if my wife can at least go and take a video or some pictures or something. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, that's... Uh, it's definitely this is this is a weird part of the case because there's a lot of people there this has been claimed by several people that David was you know either drunk or high you know because they, they like to mention the absinthe um, and even then I still think some of his Facebook posts absinthe and you know all his little comments about that they may not actually have been mm -hmm. about absinthe it could have actually just been about you know just maybe it was some kind of a quote he had maybe it was some kind of an experience he's had um, was kind of just comparing it um, I'm not fully convinced that he was really actively drinking absinthe. So. Yeah, and the whole okay. and, and, um to go to the the snapped part of all of this, and you know, it's like people are using this term like they hear it on TV and mm -hmm. they watch these movies. People all of a sudden they're they're great and happy, and then boom, they start they become serial killers. Right. No, I mean in real life, that's not how it works. Right. In People who, there really is no such thing as a snap. You have somebody who's either abusive, and there are always signs that they're going to do something. Okay, the, the majority of the time, you know that they're capable of doing something brutal. 
Mm-hmm. I have yet to ever hear of a guy <laughs> or, or even a woman that loves their family, does everything for them, you know, treats them with respect and honors <clears throat> them, you know, and will stand up and protect them. And then all of a sudden go home and just start killing everybody. It, the, the whole snapped thing needs to just be dropped out of the vocabulary. It doesn't fit. Right. And it doesn't exist. It, seriously, in the psychological world, there is no such thing as snapped. Right. You'll see the build up and all this, and you'll see how it it starts to kind of just the build up, if you will. Correct. And even if you don't see it, and they're very good at hiding it, you you'll you should still be seeing some shifts in personality at least. Maybe they're becoming a lot more like they're uh, getting a lot more inward. You know, they're just kind of keeping themselves a little bit more. Um, maybe they're being a lot more. Um, you know, focused on some project they might be working on, something like this. They're trying to go and you know, just kind of internalize it. Um, you know, that kind of thing. That's that's pretty typical. But, you know, as for the whole, you know, okay, just one moment, you know, he's great, and then just, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do this now. With no sign, no. Kamel would have known something was up. Um, and with especially with how well their relationship worked, she would have been talking them through it. They would have been talking things out. We get to see this the journal, too. We get to see lots and lots of proof of these, their relationship and how things, like their dynamic of the relationship actually worked out. And that, you know, now that you bring that up, what, and I think I spoke to Sophie about this before, what surprised me about mm-hmm. the dyna- their relationship dynamics was it really was not David who was the, the alpha in the relationship. It truly was Kamel. And Kamel um, kind of ruled the roost and... David is like, okay, he would do anything. Okay, she got upset. What am I going to do? I'm in the doghouse. Oh, great. You know, her family's making her upset. I want to make her happy, but I can't go talk to her because she's going to, you know, I don't want her to yell at me. And so the whole dynamic is, is almost completely reversed from what you're hearing. See, to me, I mean, I, I, I saw it a little different. I mean, I, for the most part, I saw that, yeah, she was very much... Um, you know, she, when she had the reins, she was she had the reins. Um, and yeah, there was she times was not where David, a wallflower. Right, right. They were very much in a lot of things together. That's why I think where Catherine, when she brought that up, saying, no, there's no way David would have just done this on his own. This would have had to have been a mutual decision. And that's where I think that kind of comes from, is is we know that Catherine and Kamel had talked um, prior to uh, finding the bodies. It was a while, but it, it ha- they actually had spoken. I think it was in... Once it was October, kind of as far as October, it was either October and well, November was the big one where they had a ton of calls. But yeah, she there was a few calls there where it, I don't think it appeared on voicemail. I think it was like six seconds came in and then it was up. I could be wrong, so don't quote me on that. But well, they, I mean, they had the, talked. The records do show clearly that um, Kate had called, almost hounded them both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so right. she made a lot of phone calls. <laughs> right. And I mean, it was like, you got to see these times where she would just hound them, uh-huh. you know, and there was times where it was like, you know, they would call and, you know, or she would call and they would talk and it wasn't a big deal, you know, but you know, where we see this big shift with the family dynamic ends up being in August anyways. So like the August, September time, that's where we really start seeing a shift. Um, and all this. So I mean, it's like, when you got to see the whole dynamic between those two, it's like she would have known. They would have been talking things through. So I, I tend to kind of go the route of Kate Crowley saying there's no way David would have done this um, unless um, Camilla had talked about this. And that kind of, for me, that kind of leads into that whole, that rapture thing that they, uh, the, the A gray state uh, brought up, you know, which is BS. I mean, I know we've talked about that before. Um, we talked about the audio it was just it was cut to all hell um right. they just took what they wanted to to make kamel seem crazy when really you know they what they were talking they were very very philosophical and we can see this through their through his journal posts you get to see this through even just even like some of her posts she had made um and how you know how she would uh you know what from the found fo- or not found footage but the footage we got and all this she, she's philosophical you know, especially the way David spoke with her or spoke about her in his journal, it kind of showed she was more kind of like a, she was a thinker. You know, so if she's yeah, talking about rapture. There's a right. Yeah, you know, she was an extremely intelligent woman, mm-hmm. and you know the and also you compare 
her and her personality and and you see that not only in the videos but you see it in um how david talks about her oh yeah in someone who is being um abused or pushed around at home they're not vocal like she is i mean if that were the case the situation would be so volatile that everybody would know about it right and there would be signs of violence prior but instead he lets her be her not saying he liked it you know what i'm saying because nobody always likes everybody who's super strong-willed or personality but when she would get like that he would just find a way to okay either backed off or he wanted to find a way to talk to her to make it better. Right. And that's not someone who's abusive, and that's not somebody who's going to turn around and, well, as we've stated, snap just doesn't happen. But the old, I'm going to snap and be mad. Right, right. Well, and, I mean, we, well, look, actually, let me, let me switch to a different slide, because that, we can actually get right into the abuse one. Let me get right into that. Um, let's see. And... Just real quick, I looked at um, Black Light 5 mm -hmm. that actually covers all the apps that had been opened um, in the recent past. Right. Uh, so it's not going to cover everything. And it's, I mean, you should look at it. Mm -hmm. There's pages of it. I'm going to have to definitely and look at it again. It's not showing up at all. So whoever is claiming the whole WhatsApp thingy is straight up not telling the truth. Right. So I they didn't use that to make extra calls. Makes sense. Well, I mean, you just put it right there. Yep. Because he used it to update his iPhone, and then as he was updating it, it has the day one log, Pandora, Apple, uh, Wells Fargo Banking, um, road, uh, Rome data, all kinds of things, Ikea. Well, you got to ask yourself, too, you know, if, if somebody is planning on killing their family and then killing themselves, are they really going to care about updating their phone? I mean, really? Yeah. Really? No. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, no, oh, no. I got, you know, this is this phone that's it's apparently it's got blood all over it. We're going to, you know, this is going to be something I want to make sure this is updated for the police when they get this. Um, you know, it's that way everything is just tip-top shape for them. Nobody does that. Nobody. Right. And like Sophia pointed out, is that not only that is the updating, but, oh, so he's going to wipe all of his prints and DNA off of the phone and only put his wife's blood on it? Does that right. make sense? Right. Yeah, that doesn't make it sense makes at all. It makes zero sense at all. Yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, so this next one, we're, you know, we're just kind of segue into this. Uh, another claim is David is abusive, so therefore he's guilty. So laughable. <laughs> so what do you guys think? Where's the proof of that? Right. Absolutely. Uh, I, if there was any proof, the police would have written it down in the report. Right. And there would have been, yeah. again, like we stated before, there would have been evidence of the abuse. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, there would, I mean, when somebody psychologically abuses you, whoever is being abused, you show it. No matter how much you try to hide, it's noticeable. And people, you know, okay, for example, someone, one of the people who was, I think it was on the stupid um, sloppy that was, that had interviewed somebody, and they, one of Kamel's quote unquote workers or friends or something, and they were blaming David for Kamel quitting her job. Oh, well, he did this, and so she quit. And then when you're reading the journal, you find out that that took David by surprise. Right. He was mm -hmm. he was like, uh-oh, she's going to quit her job, but I'm going to support her. Okay. Um, whoa. He didn't know she was going to do that. Yeah, I mean, if and anything, so, I think he was proud of her. Yeah, and he was going to back her no matter what. And so I'm like going... You know, so they, they twist it. So they, they take something from somebody who sees something because they don't understand what they're looking at. And they didn't understand that Camille was actually frustrated with her coworkers because how they were being treated mm -hmm. and how they were being paid by the company. 
So they saw that as, oh, it must be David's fault, when in reality she was angry at the employer and angry at her co-workers for not having the guts to stand up and say no enough is enough and so she's like you know what i'm done with this i'm gonna quit and and david's like oh okay yeah i'm here for you i'll do what you need right where's yeah, the abuse? she, she exactly. told him before she went to work that morning right that she was quitting and he was just shocked by it so if this was his idea, why would he be shocked? Yeah, why would he be And why would he be if... concerned about supporting them? Right. Yeah, his comments would be, yeah, it's about time. You know, I told her these mm -hmm. no good for nothings, but that's not what he says. Well, and even then, if he was abusive, he would be using this as a way to torment her, potentially. Uh, you know, right. oh, you did this, oh, you know, you know, such and such is a loser, or whatever, you know, all this kind of stuff. You could be saying all sorts of things like that. But no, he's, he's there saying, all right, uh, you know, all right, wasn't expecting that, but hey, I got you. I got you on this. We're going to go and uh, we're going to get through this. Right. But, it, but he also goes on, um, I'm not sure if it was in that entry or a later entry where he talked about, or maybe it was even before, uh, where he talked about her job and just kind of like, oh man, you know, these guys are, they're kind of scuzzy. They're just, they're slime balls. Yep. So, you know, the thing is, is, they even uh, admit in the documentary with um, Heidi Lish, I believe it was, and I believe it's also in the police reports too, that they didn't know David. So now they're just going to blame him? That doesn't seem very fair at all. Right. Mm -hmm. So just And then they up. were all too willing just to accept whatever was said, you know, especially the, the Heidi person. I, you right. Know, on that sloppymentary, so, oh, you know, and I feel so bad for my friend. That was the kind of what came across. And I'm sitting there going, really? Did you look at anything? Have you bothered to pay attention? But no, she was so easily manipulated and malleable. And maybe, okay, for a benefit of a doubt, maybe they were recording this when her loss was still fresh and she mm -hmm. couldn't really deal with anything. That, that's a possibility. But still at the same time, if that were my friend, I would be all over that. I'd be like, oh, no, 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 I'm going to be reading up on this. Did he really do this? Because if he did this, I I'm going to be putting this guy on blast. But if he right. hasn't, then I'm going to say, uh-uh, who really did it? Absolutely. I don't know. I found her story hard to buy. I agree. Like, I she too. wasn't believable. Yep. Well, especially, you know, this is the part I found very interesting, is how often she was calling Kamel. I mean, it was almost like that obsessive friend. You know, I think, mm -hmm. I think, you know, people that I've got a lot of friends, they've got that one obsessive friend that just, just insists. They call every day, several times a day, yeah. you know, and it's just like, oh, come on, give it a break. <laughs> you know, because Kamel wasn't even answering most of the, the phone calls. They would go to voicemail if she even left it for voicemail. So, you know, she would text her repeatedly and there was times Kamel wasn't even really responding. So. Yeah, and so what, you know, how I see this when I look at the dynamics of both David and Camille and their um, relationships with people who at one point were their friends, is that they grew beyond what these people were willing to do. They, they These people that used to be their friends, you know, they got stuck and they wouldn't mature, they wouldn't learn, they wouldn't change. And David and Camille were always... A, a, what from what I see and I could be wrong but it's like they wanted to always look for something better do better be better and and prepare for something other than just going with the flow absolutely and that's why I think like people like Danny August Mason uh, Joseph Seaton all this they you know when they're claiming oh well David was more like new agey thing they didn't really know even the religion or the, the faith that David and Camille had they didn't know anything about mm -hmm. them. They didn't know their friend or their uh, alleged friend, you know. Not to mention, you go over the journals and you start seeing this. Like with David, you know, he mentions Joseph Seaton and uh, Danny August Mason, Sean Wright, and Adam Shambor um, pretty consistently. Like, yeah, not really a big fan of these guys, you know. But he also does, at one point, straight up just says, you know, Joe was just kind of done with him anyways. But, yeah, this is supposed to be on the, you know, in the, according to A. Gray State. This is uh, one of David's close friends. This is yeah, and that did you notice how angry he was in the documentary? Mm -hmm. yep. Joseph? Oh, oh yeah. my goodness. I'm wondering if he read the journal 
you know, before <laughs> that. And I hope he did. pretty PO'd about it because. Oh man, David doesn't like yeah, me. <laughs> well, I mean, you could did. literally see that vein popping out of his neck. Right. <laughs> That's how angry he was. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like and wow. David, David didn't mince words in his journal. He said exactly how he felt about all of them. They were leeches. They were sucking his soul dry. And he's like, "No, you guys aren't. You're not. You're not giving anything in return. You're take, 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 take." And so he's like, no, I, I have to cut you out. I'm, le I'm cutting you all out of our lives because if you're not going to, if it's not going to be an equal give and take and all you want to do is take and ride on my coattails and say, oh, you know, I'll do this job if you pay me 50 grand a year. I mean, come on, really? You know, so it, and they, they're so, I don't know what the word is, but they couldn't even see that they were a leech. They truly convince themselves and try to convince everybody well no we're the best friend he loved us we loved him well, right. i don't think somebody yeah go back and read what he said about you he didn't love you right not at all um you know at one point i know he does say that oh these are they're good people but they're just um essentially they're just like they're not they're not for them you know they need to move past yeah. this they want they mention in the journal or he mentions very literally they want they're moving they're going to be moving to california and, to, and you know, they're going to make some new friends there. They're going to start mm -hmm. their life fresh there, which yep. that, that says a lot right there. You know, that David and Kamel, that was their plan. Why was Kamel, you know, cashing in her retirement? That's not something somebody that, you know, is, is going into a pack theory that they're going to, you know, kill themselves, you know, and, and their family. Um, that that they, don't, they don't need money, you know, where they're going, you know, at that point. They're, they don't need that. Once, you, once right. you're dead, you, you're, you're dead. You don't need the money. Well, it depends, I guess, on if you look at, like, the older religions, I suppose. Uh, but <laughs> but that's coins, then. <laughs> not not yeah. that dollar-dollar bill, you know? And so. they were so delusional that they were, they in not only in the um, slapumentary, but even in some of their conversations with us, they were like, oh, no, we were... They they're going places with David. They were they were going to be there. They were his right hand man. Right. And we're all like going, uh, no, you weren't. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He had you yeah. out for a reason. He wasn't even talking to you for mm -hmm. months, and and he was. I don't know. It, it just it boggles my mind. Well, I know I know I recently did something on the contract too. Is I know that's uh, two of the friends basically said, oh, is that you know? I think it was even more than that. It was actually even saying that. Um, that the, the contract was dead and all this, and we'll actually we'll, we'll move right in that slide next. Actually, <laughs> might as well as just go in there. So, um, since we're talking okay, about the funds, okay, and I have information on this. Perfect. It's perfect. in the black white report. All right, let me go in. If I can see this, let's see the PTSD, uh, gray state, took him to a dark place. No, um, let's see, where was it? Oh, here it is. Okay. All right. So they're saying uh, that David was spiraling out of control after he walked away from the Meg offer. I laughed my my butt off on this one a lot because we can prove without a doubt he wasn't walking away from that offer at all. He was waiting. He needed, he was waiting on one person, just one, one person, and then they were going to be able to go and continue this on. Yep. Yep. And here in black light number five, mm -hmm. the recent documents that he had been opening up before he died, uh, 2014 from July 25th, Gray State Deal Memo, uh, GSTR uh, Co-Production Agreement, mm -hmm. Final Clean GS FMF Change Contract, uh, from May 08 13, uh, BGS FMF change contract. And then the very last one, besides Mythos, was Hothead Gray State Danny Mason agreement. Ah, see, now that's something we, show, that's something we need right now. <laughs> um, is that fully proves? I mean, that goes back on the whole motive and all this, but. Um, but that's the part that oh, I find very interesting because. We're not seeing any evidence he was spiraling out of control. And like I was saying earlier, he didn't he didn't walk away from the mega offer at all. And like you were even proven right there, did not walk away. Um, 
he was waiting on Danny August Mason to sign his little, I don't know what the agreement was called, basically the agreement where he's getting more or less kicked off the island. Um, and we know that um, between him and Gleason, they talked about how Mitch Heil had already signed his, which means that goes back because that was in October. So that we go back to that meeting that Mitch Heil had with David. That's probably what happened right there. At least I would assume that he probably signed it right there and David uh, you know, whisked that off to Galeason, but they were just waiting on Danny August Mason. But now that we know that there's other, that other part there with um, the Hothead Productions deal between them and uh, Danny August Mason, it begs the question, why was he lying? He was only supposed to be an actor, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a fan. <laughs> right, right. I mean, especially considering... Yeah, that was the most uncomfortable uh, interview to watch with that one guy, uh, oh, yeah. ben, ben Swan. Oh, yeah. I, I That was so uncomfortable to watch. Right. Well, it's even more so and if you watch it. he about the Great State Universe at that time and everything. I mean, it's it's hard to watch right now, even just because everything we've got. Watching that now is just like, oh man, this guy was blatantly lying. It looks like. And David kept putting him in his place because he would try to call it his, and David be like, um, mine, mm -hmm. mine, Grace Day. I'm the one who did this work on that. And and you're like going, and then you could see Danny kind of seething. So when he'd get a chance, he'd try to call dibs on it, and David would turn around, just go, nope, right, <laughs> nobody. You're not gonna take this from me. Well, the other thing was that you guys have seen the the Sean Wright interview with um, those two, right? Yeah, it was a long time. Yes, I, I did see it once. That one, I know I did a, a reaction video, well, a reaction stream to it. I couldn't show the video for obvious reasons, but I was reacting to it. It was hilarious. Um, David would just give him a look and he would back down and was like, oh, oh, we know who the alpha is here, guys. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> this guy was just like, no, no, don't even try this. Or even the Alex Jones interview, um, same thing. Danny August Mason is trying to say something and David would just give him a look and he would just kind of just back off. It's like, oh. So, I mean, this, this is where it all comes down to. It's just like, so I think more or less this proves that this, this little guy was definitely trying to he was lying to the police because we know that those happened before. Um, you know, so if the police, they didn't look into that, I mean, it makes sense why they didn't. I mean, I can understand where, the, where they're coming from when it comes to that, but it's just a bit ridiculous because there's so much proof proving Danny August Mason lied just based on that stuff. Mm -hmm. If you go off just the police reports alone, it's, I can see where the police can come from and say, Oh, okay, well maybe, maybe it was just bad memory. You know, it, not a big deal, kind of just whatever. But obviously they didn't go and really look into his story. He wasn't the only one lying to the police, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. yeah, a good portion of his so-called friends were, <laughs> and family. Yeah, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but you know, when I, when I look at all of this, the one true friend that I see that David did have wasn't Mitch Heil. Mitch mm -hmm. Heil truly, mm -hmm. I mean, not to say he really liked everything David did and he kind of felt a little slighted, but he's like, okay, you know, hey, he's my friend and I'm going to support him in what he needs to be successful. And right. that's what a friend does. A friend will support you. These other people kept trying to take and ride and wanted David to be successful so they then could gain monetarily from it. That's 100%. not a friend. Yeah, I feel the same way. Mitch Hyle is really his only friend. Yeah. Okay, I'll be back. I'm going to go look outside again because it's getting really pretty. Sure, sure. Okay. I can't yeah, see where I am. Yeah, it's too cloudy over here. I can't see anything. Yeah, it's not quite cloudy. It's just I have some tall buildings around me that's blocking it. So. Gotcha. It's like, darn. At least you got the buildings. Mine's just clouds, but I got Oregon to thank for that one. Thank you, Oregon. <laughs> oh, lovely. Usually it is clouds, honestly. I mean. Right. I have to go on Facebook and take a look because I feel like I'm missing out. Yeah, no. But yeah, that's it. It's just really interesting because 
of all the documents he was looking at. Right. It's like, wow, okay. I mean, if, if it was a dead deal, why would he be looking at those contracts? It makes no sense. And that's just yeah. it. So there's people that were saying this. You've got Sean Wright. Um, that's that's why I've been mentioning for two weeks now, actually. Well, a month. Well, not not month, but like, yeah, about two weeks or so. Uh, Sean Wright is the next one I'm doing after the contract. And the reason being is because he talks specifically about the contract like three times. Um, you know, he says it was a 300, it was not a $300 million deal. Okay, well, sure, we know that. We can prove that that's not true. Um, it could have led up eventually to get up pretty high, but I mean, 300 mil, yeah, I don't, I don't see it. But it was, it was worth some money, and it was worth David actually prepping to go in to go to California with his family. And we could see well, that's yeah, what he was and, doing. And the whole thing is, is you know, we, we do know according to the contract that it was funded for 30 million, but that wasn't gonna be what David was gonna get. That's what they right. were gonna use to fund that whole entire, whatever they had planned for the season or for how many shows it was gonna be. But the point was, is that, you know, it looked pretty good that whatever they were gonna do, they were gonna pick it up again, like say if it was gonna be, you know, seasons type thing. There'll be more than just one season. There could be two or three seasons of whatever it was that they were gonna do. So it had the potential to really, really rake in bucks. Plus it was gonna open the door. Yeah, and then think about all the royalties too. Right. Well, and it's, so, it, I mean, is, they is, usually don't sell their movies or their scripts just for that initial paycheck. They do it for the royalties, too. Right, the royalties and then the merchandise and, you know, books and, and everything. Then syndication, I mean, it, it would have been huge. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were looking at, I mean, it, when it came down to it, it was something like, I think, $35,000 or something like this just for, like, the initial. Uh, and it was just, I believe it was on option B. Which they were still, I mean, if you read, it was option A and option B. I think 30000 was the, the floor for option A, but it could go up higher. And option B was just the flat, here's $35,000. And that's just for David, just to get optioned. Um, and then after that, then you've, of course, he's got all sorts of other things he can make money off of. You know, and all he had to do is just a lot of that stuff just had to kind of be run by the mics. That's all it had to be done. And as long as they a okay it, it's good to go. But... Even then, anything having to do with the script, the story, anything, that was also going to be ran by David as well. So, very, very interesting. You know, because, I, was, mm -hmm. I was just thinking about this, but David might have been looking at other offers in Hollywood when he was there with Ken Mel, but this is the one contract he came home with. Why would he walk away from that? Right. And do you really think that the mics would have let him just walk away without saying, you know, without trying to sweeten the deal a little bit more? Yeah, because no, I'm that pretty been, sure they saw this. Right, you're right. That would have been tons of money in their pocket. They're not going to probably let that go right away. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'll be right back. One second. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, so I just don't see him. I don't know why he wrote what he did in his journal, if he did. These journals are, they're, you know, people can edit them very easily. Well, I mean, all you have to do you is just download it. What are you referring to that he wrote? Because I don't, I don't recall or remember reading anything negative about his experience with the, with the movie deal. Uh, he didn't write, oh, actually he didn't write it in the journal. He supposedly wrote it to his dad that he walked away from the deal. But we have no proof of this. We just right. have it in the timeline. Right, because we well, that was one of the first things we were checking when we got um, the phone records, is we were looking for those phone calls and those text, text messages, and nothing went through. So, and I am not calling Dan Sr. a liar. I'm just wondering, did somebody else route something through a, no, a number, making it look like it came from David's phone? I mean, I put nothing past these people. So here, David's dad could be thinking that's what happened, when in reality, the evidence and the phone records show it didn't. Yeah. And then on top of that, I mean, the journal ends like a day or two before this supposedly happened conveniently 
Yeah. So we don't even have David's take on it. Up until then, he's super excited about the deal. Yeah. And he's anxiously waiting for the mics to contact him because he just sent that script off. Yeah, so if he was going to walk away, why would he keep writing and rewriting and then say, you know what, I can finally put this to bed because now it's done and now I can start something else. Well, he couldn't start something else if he walked away because he would have to still keep pitching it. He would have to still keep writing proposals and right. doing these boards. So it's like, how could he have walked away? Yeah, well, yeah. even then, it's it's <laughs> there, there's a lot going with the script and with with that deal he had. I think, I mean, he even admitted he was optioned with quite a few different studios. So if he was optioned with a, a few studios, he chose the mics, obviously, or the, with the mics. <laughs> um, for him choosing the mics, especially a new start, or almost like a startup, if you will, they are obviously, they were offering him a better deal. Or he was trying to avoid those other studios because they wanted more control. I think it's more or less probably control is what it came down to, though. Yeah, and I just don't see what people are saying happened actually happening. I think that this is just another thing. Right. Another disinformation or red herring or whatever you want to call it to make yourself feel better. Right. Sorry. That's how I feel at this uh, point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, since we're on the topic also of uh, the script, I mean, you've got this here too. Uh, the Grey State script put David in a dark place. Has he got any thoughts on that one? <laughs> oh, this is laughable. Right, right. Has anybody read the newest script? The one oh. that he supposedly sent out? I mean, I I'm asking the audience. I know you guys have. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ha has the audience ever read the 2014 script? Okay, well, it's not dark. Right. <laughs> it's, it's not like the trailer at all no not at all it's um see the yeah. thing is, is if they were to go and see the 2013 script then you compare that you know the one where danny august mason was heavily involved the only one where john wainick was actually in because he wasn't involved in the newer script so that's mm -hmm. the other funny part about that because he it was that offer that david basically said he's like i'm willing to go and give you um you know, we'll get, we'll talk about, you know, like a producer credit and you'll be able to act uh, in the John Wainick role. Funny because John Wainick wasn't even in there. So <laughs> <laughs> he obviously didn't know that at the time. So this kind of just proves that at least Danny August Mason had no idea that John Wainick wasn't actually in the newer script. He kept thinking it was the older script. So we're, that's, that's where that all goes. Is that's, that's hilarious because the new script, it's, it's, it's the character of Daniel Walker that's like very much like he's a badass. I mean, that's the best way I could describe it. Daniel Walker was an absolute badass in that in that story, but he was, you know, he was a lot more relatable than either uh, Daniel Nicasi was. Going down mm -hmm. the the 2013 script, with that, I can understand when that wouldn't be in dark, but at the same time, I know we've discussed this um, on my stream and on uh, the podcast before as well that. Um, when it came to the, the older script, it, it was almost like there was like two, three people writing that one, which, well, different writing styles oh, yeah, that they're the all peeking through. Is, yeah, the first one's clear. It's it's not the same voice. It's not the same writing style. Right. You know, and but, we know. You know to go I am back, glad. Go oh. ahead. Go ahead. No, I was no, just going to say. Okay, one, two, three, so you go. <laughs> you go first. No, you go first. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that I was glad that he took that guillotine scene out of the script because that, that is the one thing that has given me nightmares. Right. Is that guillotine scene. But it was Where supposed it was to. Tent. I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> I'm not one for stuff like that. I love a great action movie and everything, but that just, oh, after reading about the guillotines and Obamacare or anything, that just was a little too close to Rome. Right. Well, and I honestly, that's where well, I got feel supposed to. Yeah, I think yeah, that's where he got it from. To. I'm sorry, William. I mean, uh, I, I think that's where he actually got it from, was um, pulling directly from what they had found. 
um, all the Correct. different, uh, you know, like for instance, like um, if I'm not mistaken, I could have sworn they also mentioned, at least in like kind of a, descript a descriptor um, about the the black coffins. I could have sworn they mentioned that, um, but they, I mean they mentioned all sorts of different things that it was very obvious. You know, he had he had been listening to what Alex Jones had, um, had said. He probably did some um, research on what Alex Jones had said. Um, because that was the other change we also got to see is there was no Infowars sticker on the car. There's no Alex Jones like references in the, in the newer script. He was completely cut out. Yeah, and what I saw, what I was going to say is, you know, here where it says the great state script put David in a dark place. Well, if he was in such a dark place, why was he starting to write new scripts for new movies and he was really excited that he could... <laughs> expand his creativity oh my right. god he was so dark uh no he was writing he was right. excited happy yeah well even then oh. if you look at the journal entries that's the really interesting part because he's talking about how he wants to get away from it it's like i'm yes, running away he from to put this. it to bed right yep. <clears throat> he wanted to move on to the next uh the next big script and, and that it, is not being in a dark place because you cannot write and be creative when you're in a dark space for the most part i mean right. i know some acid rock writers maybe that's where they have to be to get their screaming song and lyrics but when you're Here's writing well. <laughs> films and, and books and stuff that the type that he was doing you can't be depressed and losing it and losing control and your grip on reality is slipping no the guy had it together mm -hmm. yeah it's, i mean i mean there, there i mean there's some writers i mean look at poe i'm pretty sure that guy was in a dark place at all times uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that, that's Poe. But um, these guys, though, when... T okay, if you know anything about those writers and those artists, they were higher than kites, constantly right. drunk, doing things to get that creative juices flowing because when they weren't, mm -hmm. they could not write. Right. David was not relying on, on, you know, some substance to get him to go. So that's what I'm saying. When you look in reality, he wasn't right. in a dark place. Right, exactly. He was, uh, he was in a place of... Uh, he was trying to get away from that stuff anyway, so he didn't like the way it made him feel. Um, my guess is he probably didn't get a whole lot done um, and was probably uh, really just starting to look in things a little, from like, you know, maybe, maybe it was getting dark when he was on, um, you know, when he was smoking the pot and, uh, you know, drinking and all this. I mean, maybe, maybe that's the place it did take him, but he got off that. He, was, he made that very, very clear. He didn't like the feeling. You know, it goes right back to that full circle and the drinking and the being high and all this we know he wasn't coming from that kind of an angle. I mean, just to kind of leap off on that other little part to it, they also, you know, the police also said that he was, um, he wasn't sleeping. Well, we can see that he was, <laughs> you know, because anyway, it just brings up the timeline. You can go look through phone records. You can see all this. There's a big gap. And if he wasn't sleeping a ton during the day, he, you can see these periods where it's like, you know, three hours here, you know, there's no activity at all. Then there's another three, four hour period throughout the day, you know, so he was sleeping still. It's not that he wasn't. He definitely, it, those periods right there, they're kind of showing, well, what was he doing during this time? Was he just kind of sitting there, you know, uh, twiddling his thumbs the whole time? Or is he just, <laughs> you know, just literally just asleep? I'm pretty sure that's what was going on. Yeah. So, and this is also coming from a guy that, you know, he, he'd been to war. So he probably valued his sleep quite a bit. <laughs> You know, he's like, no, 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 I want to sleep here. I'm going to go sleep. Oh, and let me tell you, the military will teach you to fall asleep in a fraction of a second. Those right. guys go out like a light, but wake up super fast, too. They right. have to. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah. And they teach you that right in basic. You know, yep. they, they want to get you ready for being in a wartime scenario just in case. Because you never know. Um, but he was also, he was a soldier, too. So that would have been even more crucial for him to do. You know, you got to get up on the fly. You know, you're gonna you, you get some sleep here, and then bam, okay, we're we're going right now. So you got to get up. So yeah, this is somebody that he was. This isn't like unheard of, like him just getting three hours here, and then you know, you know, maybe not a full night's rest. But I mean, he's this is a soldier. He's gonna be used to this kind of stuff. So, but as for him being in a dark place, the other thing I like to really um, talk to people because when it comes to this dark place, the other thing people also bring up is the search history. I forgot to bring that in here, but um, the search history, saying, oh, well, you know, look at the search history. He was he was definitely in a dark place. Look at all those the mass shootings or the the massacres and all this he was watching. Well, it's like, but he's getting... It went this, to this his went to movie. Script. 
Yeah, he wanted to make it, he wanted to really rock somebody's mind, to really shock them. Because that's what his movie's supposed to do. He even described it in almost every single interview and talking about his movie. Uh, you know, what his, uh, even the show, whatever. He wanted, he wanted to shock people. From an artistic well, and standpoint. this is it's all part of the process too like mm-hmm. i have a um a, a writing friend of mine and um i i asked her i'm like okay because where i struggle in my writing is doing all this descriptive and describing things i'm i'm like i want to fill the in the blanks myself which i guess most people don't want to do but <laughs> for her so she sat there and she told me she's like okay you need to do this here's the exercise i'm going to give you Turn right. on your TV, and every commercial that comes on, you write down everything you see them doing. They lifted their hand, they moved their hair, they opened the door. So, you know, writers will watch everything that's going to pertain to what they're doing to not only make sure that they are um, have enough descriptors and that they keep that those juices flowing, but that they understand what it is that people are seeing and what is drawing other people in. Those right. storylines, is it a truth, is it a lie? And the only way to do that is to watch it. Absolutely. Well, and even then, it's like, you know, like I was saying before, when it comes down to the, the scenes, he's looking at um, the Katyan Forest Massacre. I think that's how you say it. Something like that. But he's watching this. He's got like, I think, two, three different times he's watching this. And it's all in the same day. It's not like it's you know, over the course of like, you know, two weeks or anything. No, 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 this is the same day. And it's like the first thing he is searching. Well, why is he searching this out? Well, you look over in the, the newer script. There's a good reason why he's looking into this. Because there's that scene in the script, uh, not to give too many, well, you know what, screw it. Spoiler alert. Um, in the in the script, they talk about the scene where the bad guys, the, the bad group, the New World Order, if you will, they're rushing in here and they just start killing this neighborhood. It's just people that are just trying to live their lives. They're fighting back, yeah, but they're just having a good time. And they're coming in and just start shooting people. They have a dog maul somebody. All this is like, oh, geez. Well, what happened with the Cotton Forest Massacre? That was pretty damn dark, you know? Yeah. It was really, really grim. You know, massacre's massacre. It's going to be dark no matter what. But how it was done, you know, that's, that's the type of thing. He was taking that, and he was almost like, it was kind of like a copy and paste. And then, you know, like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, like, uh, how some artists do. They'll take um, they'll take an image that's already out there, and they'll go and they'll print it off, and then they want that pose or something that's in the background there. And they'll go and they'll hook it up on their light box if they're doing it, you know, freehand. They'll get another piece of paper and just kind of trace over that area or just draw something similar, but trying to go and capture that. I think that's essentially what he was kind of doing. Um if you will, just kind of like how that that scenario broke down. He's following that as he's writing his script. I think it's more or less what he was kind of going over. Mm-hmm. So. I, I could see that. So, I mean, I mean, I'm guilty when I was doing my comics and stuff. Uh, you know, I, I like a pose that the character's in. All right, let's go get this pose. Let's go and get it all drawn up. And, uh, you know, I'll go over with my light box so I can kind of capture where the skeletal frame is of a character. And then just go from there and I build my character off of that. I like the pose. Great. I'm going to take the pose. It's a good pose. So. Yeah. And when I was part of a writing group before, and I'm telling you all of us, cause we were, um, all of us were either writing horror, sci-fi or paranormal mm-hmm. books. And every single, it was the running joke going, Oh boy, if the police look at our laptops, we're in trouble right. because of the things we researched, the things we had to read, um, you know, watch and all this other stuff. I mean, you would have gone, oh my goodness, these people have lost their minds. But it was all research for our books. Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. It's a process, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think, I don't think the police necessarily, that's why I don't think they really viewed that as, oh, you know, he was in a dark place per se. I think that's why it was, it was kind of meant, it wasn't ever mentioned that, oh, he was in a dark place. I don't, at least I don't recall it being mentioned that he was in this dark place. Um, I meant, I remember very clearly that a couple of his so-called friends were saying, oh, sometimes Dave would go to a dark place and we'd have to drag him out. The one person I don't, I don't recall actually bringing this up was, uh, was uh, Mitch Heil, which goes back on the whole friend thing. That was his only friend. Mm-hmm. Everybody else was trying to go and paint David in this, uh, oh, you know, he lost weight and 
Uh, you know, he was not fit anymore. He was all jacked up. You know, he was not sleeping. He was on drugs. He was drinking all the time. The script was just messing him up. When really, in well, reality, when we look at all of it, and, it's not true. Yeah, and it's all in how they're twisting it, you know, because mm-hmm. I do think that David states in his journal that there was a point where he was so focused on what he was doing um, that all he did really was right. And he's like, oh, man, if I ever do that again, yeah, you got to let me know. And, right. But that wasn't a quote unquote dark place. It's unless you write, you're not going to understand this. But you do. When you get into something and you get so focused, everything goes away. You right. forget to eat. You forget to go to the bathroom. You forget to take a shower. You, you forget even what time of day it is. You're so focused mm-hmm. on getting this thing done and getting on paper. And you lose yourself in that and you become your work really becomes you and you become your work Mm -hmm. that's not going to a dark place it's kind of like in not a dark place in the sense of what they're trying to twist it to be and david was like going oh boy i mean and it drained you he's like i don't want to do that again so if you guys see me doing that let me know and so you know (laughs) i don't want to spend three days writing scripts you know right And, and that's way different than than losing your mind exactly uh, do you got anything else on that, uh, Sophia? Uh, no, I mean, sorry, my daughter was talking to me. Uh, it's all good. Uh, I've actually been working on my book, and what Catherine was saying is, is very true. Mm-hmm. It's like I'll wake up early in the morning so I could do some writing, and knock out something, at least a couple pages or whatever, and it's, I lose track of time, and all of a sudden the kids are up, and, you know, they're getting ready for school, and I, I literally have to pin it down so that I can help and get them out the door and, and everything. But, right. you know, it's like I, you do lose track of time. You don't want to be distracted at all. And... Uh, Anyway, but, I mean yeah. that's, that's the big thing. And it's just focus. I wouldn't. <laughs> and because of this case, and the things that I've had to research and stuff, I seriously do not want the cops looking at my search history. <laughs> <laughs> I think I better be deleting that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, like that, a weirdo. Right. <laughs> well, and what what it comes down to is just it's a it's a focus thing. You know, some people they just they see that as, oh, this person's just antisocial or whatever. But no, the, this person is just straight up focusing. I mean, I lose track of time. I'm very, very guilty of this. I'll be working on something. I'll be doing research. I'll be doing, you know, reading, whatever. And I can lose track of time. You know, even when I was gaming, same thing. I'd lose track of time. Oh, I'm so much progress is happening. So, you know, I lose track of time. And I think that I think that's what David was kind of experiencing. But these other guys are like, no, 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 no. That's a dark place. Yeah, but why is that? Why is that a dark place, though? I, I don't, I don't see it. It's just more focused, guys. I mean, <laughs> right. What was it that I was watching where Sean had written? Sean Wright had written that he had shown up to David a couple times when he was in the middle of writing, <clears throat> and he tried to have a conversation with David, and David was like, shh. shh just sit there. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, but... Yeah. I mean. <laughs> but I can't remember where I read this. Oh, I, I read that somewhere, too, mm-hmm. and I can't remember either. But I thought David had stated it, too, in, in the journal. And he's like, you know, you're coming up... I mean, as a writer, and you guys, uh, you guys know, if somebody comes over and they interrupt you, you're going to tell them, hey, quit your yapping. I have an idea. I got to get it down. Right. So stop mm-hmm. talking. <laughs> yeah, it's like, just give me a second. Come on, it's okay. Just just give me a second. I'll be right with you. Just one second. <laughs> that um, second yeah, will turn into a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I it's, you know, five really minutes. Sometimes this. it's, yeah. Well, I can't do this with the kids because they don't understand. They're too young. You know, so if I just tell them in a minute, they don't, they can't comprehend that. Right. But my daughter, I'll just, like, hold my hand up. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> just, just back off for a few minutes. I got to get this thought out. Yeah, just, just, just give me a second. I'll be I'll done just a second. <laughs> no, I get that. 
<laughs> so the next part we got here is that the Crowley family was broke and once again, David just snapped. Thoughts on that one? <laughs> Come on, Sophia, I know you have stuff to say on this. <laughs> there was a $14,000 check on the porch. Right. <laughs> Okay. And their bank account was not empty. Yeah, they yeah, still had money. I, I just don't. I don't understand how you could send that amount of money to somebody. You don't trust it to send it through the mail, so you drop it off and you put it on their front porch. Right. Okay. Right. Sure. <laughs> That's fully believable. Yeah, that was. Yeah, I found uh, that part very odd. So I'm not sure. Maybe when Dan Crowley. Uh, junior decided to drop it off. Maybe he didn't know that it was in there. I mean, that's a possibility. Or maybe I would love. I would love to see a fly on the wall when Dan Senior found out that Dan Junior dropped that check off on the porch and left it there. Right. I want to be able to fly on the wall just uh, you know that discussion with uh, where did my fifty thousand dollars go? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be a fly on the wall for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because that was, that was an odd one. So, I mean, if, if Dan Jr. could easily pull from that $50,000, and David, we know he wanted just to kind of separate, but he did have that as a backup. If they were really that broke, I mean, I wouldn't have put it past anybody to really be like, okay, well, I'll tap into this a little bit, you know, and then we'll, you know, replenish it over time or something like this. Um, but yeah. I don't even think that was necessarily it either. I don't think he had to replenish if he didn't want to, because it appeared that the dad would just continually replenish if that was the case, you know, because we didn't see it. And didn't, I don't believe Dan Jr. actually even, I don't think that was him replenishing. I believe it was Dan Sr. who replenished Correct. that 50000 Yeah, it so, was. It was. So that, that just brings it you, back to that. You've been looking at the phone records. Did you see all the calls that David made that following Monday after the fifty grand was withdrawn? He mm. made all these calls to Wells Fargo. Oh. And it, yeah, you need to look that up. That's interesting because I'm sure that the bank closed early on that Saturday when um, I guess maybe Dan Senior was contacted or maybe David was contacted. I'm not exactly sure how this went down. So I'm just assuming. But he then makes quite a few calls to Wells Fargo that following Monday. Really? Yeah. So what are you implying? Are you trying to say that David took that six that fifty grand? No, I don't think no, so. No, no. I think David was trying to find out what exactly happened. Right. That Dan Senior got an alert or something. But wasn't and... it fifty grand? Oh, oh, Wells Fargo from his account at mm -hmm. his bank account, not his mortgage. Oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Now, now yeah. I'm with you. Sorry. <laughs> well, they're all together. Right. I mean, okay. all those accounts David had access to. Okay. And so I'm thinking that Dan Sr. got the alert and asked David to take care of it or to follow up or something. I don't know what it was going on. To find out but what it was there's, about. But there's calls. Interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull it up here in just a second for everybody to see. So that was, uh, what date was that? $50,000. That was like, what, November? It was in October? October. Was it October? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, it's the middle of October. Okay, let's see, middle of October. Let me go get the. Why are you looking that up? I'm gonna go look at the moon again. It's so pretty. I wish you guys <laughs> could see it. I'll be back. Uh, no worries, no worries. So we got the withdrawals. I'm looking at it on YouTube. Uh, let's see. So we Ooh. got the fifty thousand dollars was October the uh, between the eighteenth and twenty fourth. Perfect. All right. Let's take a look at the phone number timeline. All right, let's go see Wells Fargo. Uh, let's see, there's a lot of CC coins, which we know those are like a call forwarding service. I believe it was CC coin. I want to say it was CC coin. Maybe it wasn't. There was somebody there that was a call forwarding service. Uh, let's see. Wells Fargo. There it is, 1108. Um, 
Yeah, the earliest one I'm seeing, it looks like 11.08. And it's, uh... Mm -mm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I found. Yeah, on it. I'll take a look and see. Um, it's, it would have to have been an under an unknown number. That's the only way that would have not been. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me look it up, because Dan and I actually did a video on this years ago. Interesting. Actually, two years ago, so. Okay, so I'll look it up. All right, much appreciated. <clears throat> mm -hmm. As we're looking, it's it's got to be between uh, the 18th and the 24th. Was it his new number that you have pulled up? Yeah, that's the new phone number timeline. That's all I've got. That's only the new numbers on there. I've got the, the older one, but that's uh, I'm still putting that one together. There's so much to go over. <laughs> what, is the, what is the last four of the new number? I think. Um, last okay. four. Let me make sure it's not up on the screen. Perfect. It's not. Uh, the new number, uh, was the 4890. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So okay, th if that occurred, uh, before the 21st, when, then yeah, that would have been the older phone number. Uh, I can take a look at that one. I should have, I think I, I have that one. Right, it is the older phone number. It would have had to have been because the newer one is not popping up. So, let me see. Da, 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 da. Oh, gosh, I hate this. <laughs> it's all sideways. Yeah. Well, that's why I just got it all in okay. here, and I can just go and take a look. Let's see. Old phone number timeline. Um, all right. Oh, yeah. this is taking forever to load. saying anything about that. Okay, well, then I'll have to go and skip through. So I know for a fact there was Wells Fargo on the old one. Uh, maybe I haven't gone that far in then. Maybe. Let's see. Nope. If it's not David, but it's got to be Kamel. Uh, so we're looking on from the 21st. We have Kamel. There's a ton from Kamel. There's unknown numbers. Those are all, I believe, blanks. Like there was no number there. Or there was like uh, one of those AT and T ones. Uh, let's see, Wells Fargo. Is that? I mean, if it was under Wells Fargo, then I would have had that listed as Wells Fargo on the newer one. See, so yeah, it would have had to have been on the older phone uh, phone numbers. I don't have that one all the way up that that far. So. Okay, just give me a minute. You guys sure. can cover. And I'm in October right now. Okay. I just gotta figure out what Wells Fargo's number is. Is the moon like red right now or something? So now Greg is saying the moon's a trip right now. <laughs> so I don't know. I can't really see it. The clouds are super. Yeah, I can't uh, see it either. Very super cloudy out there. Oh, it's all yeah, I'm gonna go on Google or I'll YouTube it later. <laughs> but yeah, I mean we I mean, we can basically already show that David's family was not broke by any means, and if there was any issue with finances, David I'm sure would have just pulled money from the other account, the big one with five hundred thousand dollars. So I don't I don't see that as an issue. I think that's pretty reasonable, pretty uh pretty self explanatory. So Definitely not broke. All right, let's see the next one we've got. Let's see, uh, no, no, we went over that one. Oh, my favorite one. This is, this is the most hilarious one. Whoopsies. When I say hilarious, I mean just, it's kind of sad. That this is where it went. But. 
both David and Camille's families and friends uh, believe the narrative. Oh, jeez. <laughs> that, yeah, that breaks my heart. I, 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 oh. Only I don't men. see how. We can always look at the one thing with, uh, there was one person at least um, in David's family that was close to both David and Camille, at least at one point. But Catherine, she didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Right. Any more thoughts on that? I just find it interesting whether or not she died from natural causes, but you know, the one person who vocalized, she didn't believe her son was guilty and then ends up dead a few months later. Right. Yeah, it's just like, No, it's it's sad because I mean I'd love to go and find out how did she exactly pass. I mean, she was sitting outside. Her boyfriend didn't come over and see her the night before or anything like this. I mean, ah, uh, hmm. I don't know. I'm not buying it. I'm I'm curious. Like, what was her relationship with her boyfriend at that point that he wouldn't come check on her, especially not hearing from her or something like this? Um, I don't know. That just seems something like that would have been a little typical, you know, kind of good relationship going to check on on the, the partner, you know, go check on them and make sure they're all right. You know, especially that they're not responding. Well, I mean, then it's like, well, why aren't you responding? But we also know what the relationship is like. So I don't know. Yeah, but I, you know, I don't get, I do not understand, um, you know, David's dad and I'm not judging him. I'm saying I don't understand it. You know, with Camille's family, it kind of makes sense because, you know, that's the wife and, and you know, they, they might want to just say, okay, it's easier to believe David did this, although, well, for whatever reason. But David's own father, mm -hmm. his brother and his sister, yeah, everybody's just content and, and they just let him go. He's, you know, they, I don't know. I, I couldn't do that. If it was my family, even if I thought they were guilty, and I'm pretty freaking harsh. Just ask my family. I, I, have, I would have no problem telling one of my family members, screw you, kiss my ass, and we'll talk later if they were a complete jerk. Right. Um, but at the same time, you you want to go, are you sure they did this? That doesn't sound like them. You know, how did this happen and, and what really happened? But everybody just took it okay. Yep, David did this. Makes sense. But it doesn't. And these are people that actually got, I, I'm like 99% sure, they got all the details before anybody else did. This is what happened. Uh, this is what we believe happened, all this. They were in communication with the police. So, you know, it's that's that's the part that's really sad about all this. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's uh, it's really unfortunate because I mean you're you're seeing from his sister she doesn't give a crap you know she just goes and confronts David in the email you get to see David's brother he doesn't really care he's not trying to call him or text him um, you know you, the dad doesn't try and call or text him especially on the new phone number there is not a single sign and even then his dad lied on a gray state just outright just said yeah uh, David texts me oh it's just you know. What was it? Um, like he was walking away from the script. It was like, why are you lying about the script now too? And, and this and this contract deal. That's the part that confused me because well, even and his that's, dad's that's lying. That's what I was it. trying to tell you about earlier, though. Is did somebody send it but make it appear like it could have come from David's phone? But still, even you would think if that were my child and I knew what they had put blood, sweat, and tears into a movie deal like that. And if I got some stupid text that said, oh, I walked away from a, cha uh, you know, a change of heart or whatever, whatever stupid ass comment, I'm sorry, just piss oh, me it's off. Good. I would be calling them. I would have, and if they didn't answer, I would be showing up at their door going, what is wrong with you? Get your head out of your butt and get back to this. Absolutely. But nobody have a family to support. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that was a good opportunity. It was a very, very good opportunity. Not to mention the Mike's even talked about, oh no, 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 that deal was that deal was still in the works. Yeah. 
So And they were the ones who offered it, so they would know. Right. Right. David didn't he didn't back out on them. No. They they it's very clear in uh, if you go over the contract, it's very, very clear that David needs to go and do a few things before they can actually go and sign the deal because it even says right there at the very top something along the lines of um, David Crowley and something else, but it basically says, uh, you know, soon to be basically business, you know, not not verbatim like that, but essentially soon to be the, the LLC is going to be, that's what we're going to refer to as, um, I don't know what it was being referred to, but it's being referred to something else. And essentially anytime they're referring to David Crowley, boom, it's this right here. I believe it's the, like the product or something like this. Um, Oh, no, it's the work. What is his what it was? The work. So when it comes down to it, it's like that deal is still in the works. Why is David's dad lying about this? And even then, we've got proof that David didn't tell his dad anything about this. There was nothing there in the phone records. So if there's nothing in the phone records stating this, you know, showing that, okay, yeah, during this time, David had texted his dad or called his dad, um, and this is what was discussed or when it was texted. Well, there's no text message. There's no phone calls. So if there's none of that, then why is his dad lying? And that's what I wonder. It's like, has Dan Sr. even read anything? You know, because I get it. At the very first moment, and when all this was happening, I can only imagine, and I don't really want to imagine, but I can only imagine the shock. And he must have mentally shut down and just right. said, okay, okay. Um because you, how do you process that? You can't process your child being killed like that. However, through all these years, didn't it just dawn on him just once? Didn't it prick his memory, his brain to go, did my son really do this? Maybe I should look into it. Right. And honestly, I mean, that's where we, I think we can go and take a look at the journal and, and see the same thing, what was stated. Um, because he goes in, um he calls it like the, was it the Crowley curse, the Crowley gene or something like this. But David talks pretty nasty about his dad in a way, like really just describes him as this guy who's just career oriented and really the kids are kind of a burden, you know? And I can understand where David's like, you know, I don't want to, I want to break this is I don't want to be like my dad. And that's essentially what right. he's saying in his journal. So if he's saying right. he doesn't want to be like his dad, obviously there's something there where maybe he's not a big fan of his dad. So, yeah, but um, I, I, think, I, Go ahead. I, I found the, the calls to Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. They're on his own old phone log and uh, it starts on page 261. Okay. 262. And he, uh, this is uh, October 20th, 2014. Okay. Yeah, that so falls in that week. So that makes sense. And it was uh, 5.26 p.m., 5.31 p.m., and 5.35 p.m. You said it was on the 20th, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's take a look at something real quick. So, if we're looking at the 20th, then it must have happened on the 19th. So let's go and just check the, the receipts. When was that? No, it would have happened the 18th. The receipt was? Uh, when they, when whoever went into Wells Fargo would have been the eight. Yeah, so that was on a weekend, 18th. wasn't it when he called? No, that was the 20th, and I believe that was the Monday. Okay. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Just got to go and get in here real quick. Let's see. That's what I'm curious about. It now is if if the receipt that was I mean whenever that was, it would just be nice just to have it up, so we can just reference it real quick. Here's receipts. Let's see, is it this one? Yeah, right here is on the 18th, uh, on 2014, 18, 2014 uh, day. It was a, yeah, that was a Saturday, so that was most likely done earlier in the morning, too. It's generally, banks aren't open like past like 1 or whatever. So, if we're looking at that, 
doesn't have the exact time on there, but that, I mean, that makes sense. It's blacked out too, it looks like redacted. But yeah, that's a, uh, and even then it, it almost looks like they were trying to write the 19th. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So then you got the 20th and those calls are made. So yeah, it's David probably checking in and be like, whoa, what is this? What is this $50,000 and, and why'd you pull this out? He doesn't have a call from his dad at all mm -mm. coming in. So either his dad got a hold of him through Facebook or maybe a text message. I No, I don't think there was anything in the no. phone records for David or for uh, Dan C. Will, can, can you go back to that the receipt and then um, um, oh, it show like off? there was a... I wanted to look at something, see if I could. Um, sure. Yeah, the receipt right there. Yeah. And is there a second page where it shows a signature? Mm hmm. Mm, well, you can see, David. Oh, okay, this that's is... different. Okay, but yeah. okay, now on, then on the receipt one, right there, um, can you zoom in? So, because it looks like there's some little, no, right. Yeah. Is there. I'm trying to see if they have a time in with those little numbers. Mm, doesn't look Down like below, it. Down below, right where the, the numbers are, the, the, but I can't see it. It's too small. All right, let's you're, see. You're up too high. Where it says, uh, yeah, if you scroll up, scroll up. Yeah, right in there, that where it says 1948, um, go back. Yeah, in there, those, that, at one, four, one, nine, four, eight, it's somewhere in there on that line. I was trying to see if, if, if that had any information, but it's not readable. It doesn't mm -mm. look like. Okay. No, it says one, nine, four, eight, five, six, two, four, five, five. But yeah, no, there's, there's no time on here. Just got the date. And it, the, the time very well could have been up here potentially, um, or down here, but but usually, I mean, the the little printout at right that's on that same line is that bold number. Mm -hmm. It could have a time and, and date and, and then other information on that, but I can't see it. Right. Yeah, there's there's nothing on here saying time, which sucks. But it's really interesting because it's like this fifty thousand dollars. What is this used for? You know, and that's the part I would love to find out. What was this fifty thousand used for? Is that's that's not a small little chunk of change there. No, that's pretty good pile yeah and just especially to go when it's coming from the father's account and the son has taken it out and his father's not in the country right so it just kind of begs the question what was he doing yeah so but yeah so basically what we're seeing here is i mean the family and friends i mean you've got sean wright all for it and uh mason hendrix all for it um you've got Dan Jr., Dan Sr., you got Heidi Lish. I mean, you've got all these different people that are all back in this narrative. Yeah, well, this narrative seems pretty legit, but there's no proof to show this. We see David talking about, in the journal, about them getting away from the family and friends because, well, they're just, they're mooches. That's all they are. Right, and there have, there have been a couple of um, soldiers who, uh, served with David. One guy did, I think it was a TikTok video or something like that. And then there was another, another um, soldier. I don't remember if he did a YouTube or did another kind of video. And they're like, no, there's no way he did this. So people who were friends of David that weren't part of this gray state thing, mm -hmm. all believe his innocence. But it seems like everybody who was associated with gray state say he's guilty. Right. Well, and, it's, and what's I funny find is, that interesting. What's really also pretty funny is even the producers, um, you know, the Meg or the Meg, they didn't really. It didn't seem like they really were buying it either. Right. And they got they got to go and meet David. They got to go and see this. I mean, I think it kind of irritated, you know, um, irritated him a little bit. I think that was how they were trying to go and perceive David as this cocky individual. But it wasn't that he was cocky. He was just he was planning, and he was very very precise. He was very logical. Um, if he came well, off a little cocky. When, I mean, yeah, and then when that dipstick who was it nelson or herzog or what whoever took whatever david was rehearsing and then let them listen to it he's you know where he's giving himself this pep talk to you know 
do his speech and his spiel so he's ready when he goes to talk to him mm -hmm. and then plays it so it comes across like David is some arrogant gas bag. And those guys were like, oh, whoa, that's not who we met. And now their feelings were hurt. Mm -hmm. And they did it on purpose. I'm like, what kind of an... Oh, okay. You can say it. Plain. No, you can say it. What kind of fucking asshat are you to do some kind of shit like that? Yeah, You know, absolutely. I don't give a fuck if you are from Hollywood. You don't do that to somebody. Right. And then pat yourself on the back like you did something great. You are a low-life scumbag. Right. And that was just wrong. Because what he all he did was, you know, um, record himself giving a speech to pep him up, which showed me that he wasn't as confident as he put out there, that talking mm -hmm. was not something he really looked forward to. Well, and even then, read that if you read the journal too, it says the same thing. You know, he's he was nervous, he was anxious. Yeah. You know, this is a yeah. guy that he's like, oh man, I really hope I don't blow this. You know, and what's really funny is that was another one. I also did. Um, I was looking at it, and they cut the crap out of that one too. You know, you can see you can see it with the film itself. You can see, you can see with the audio and all this, they cut the crap out of that. And you can oh, tell from the background noise. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can get into. And what they, I mean, they, that's all they did. They were trying to go and play the world against David. That David was this PTSD-ridden, drug addict, drunk, abusive person who just was crazy. But really, he wasn't. It, you know, it's just like disgusting. the dystopian. Yeah, and what's disgusting is I, I do have, it's not on this laptop, otherwise I would send it to you. It's on my other laptop. But there is an article where this, it was Eric Nelson, right? Mm -hmm. He was him and Herzog or Wurzog, whatever that yeah, the dipshit's name is. But anyway, um, you know, he's, he's having this article written in, a, in, in an online newspaper saying, blatantly saying, he goes, oh, well, I had a narrative, so I cut and pieced things together and I had it set up so people would end up saying things. So people would then um, kind of draw the conclusion I'm leading to and it worked. Right. So, yeah, you just told the entire world you wrote a narrative and you were you had a purpose in mind to say he was guilty and you were happy that people were following your line of thinking, not the facts of the case. It had nothing to do with any truth or facts. It was all about where he wanted people to go and what he wanted people to think. And he was happy he succeeded. Yeah, he was that basically just like, here's your caller. And uh, I'm going to go. I've got the leash here and I'm going to drag you guys this way. Uh, we're going to go yep. and put some blinders on so you can't see the rest of the story here. And just yep. going to walk this way. And, uh, oh, hang on. Let me uh, let me put up some little, uh, you know, green screen effects here. And here we go. We're going to walk through this area where you guys are going to think, oh, this guy's just crazy. But really, it's just uh, it's just smoke and mirrors. This guy's, they, they literally did exactly, and I, I know this has been brought up multiple times. Um, they did exactly what it said in in David's uh, 2013 script about the, you know, what's the worst they can do? Kill me? Oh, is that the worst you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're gonna go and they're gonna go and ruin your your legacy. They're gonna ruin your memory. So everybody thinks you're this and, just heinous evil person. Yeah, and they're proud of themselves. I have that written down. No, what's I up? have that whole quote written down. Yeah, it's a good one. I put it into yeah, uh, the death of tra death of the family trailer number two. So it's actually the beginning of my book. Oh, is it really? Yeah, and it's a great, <laughs> yeah. it's a great quote because you is. see, you know, you see the truth in it all. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because well, even to this day, I mean, we are fighting. Well, not fighting. It's like that's not the right word. But we are constantly having to deal with these nimrods who just want to think he's guilty just because they have nothing to back it up. They they show nothing, but because they saw that stupid slothumentary, mm -hmm. oh no, it's telling the truth. So they were successful in creating this hatred in other people toward a man who was slaughtered in his own home with his family. Right. How disgusting and mental is that? Well, and, and, you know, yeah. as we always go over, too, it's and this seems to be just the general trend. There's so much from the crime scene that already disproves that was the case. And the big one to really just look at real quick, just, just briefly looking at the crime scene is, where's all the blood? You see they're missing appendages. There's no blood. 
where and you know then you just you start following that and it's like well okay the trash was taken out there's nothing in there who took the trash out then you know and so it leads right back to that and it's then you start going and exploring the rest of the crime scene and seeing all these other things bodies being moved you see mold you see um no high velocity blood spatter you know you're there's lots and lots of things okay. you're seeing they're just like what you know and it doesn't take much to see it but the people aren't looking at the crime scene and it's not that they're the or photos are hard to find you know where's I mean, the blood pools from their heads from right. laying there as they died well and even then where's all the uh, the excess uh, uh what's it called a uh, decomp fluid Where's all that? You got yeah. some on there, but that would have seeped through the carpet. That's not going to get all absorbed in the carpet. That would have seeped through. Not to mention the you had hole, uh, you know, a hole in the carpet. That would have seeped in through there. There would have been some stuff going in there, and then on top of that, then you have the floor itself. You got something that's just it's not going to necessarily absorb it super quick, but it's going to kind of the fluid will sit there. So it'll, you know, with the dog moving around all that, that's going to get down the hole. Why is there nothing in the basement? You know. So that's and, and no matter how many times we try to educate some of these people, you know, a body decomposes at the rate it decomposes. Mm -hmm. I don't care what your ego is trying to tell yourself. Right. But when the autopsy reports stay early to moderate and they're able to section and take tissue samples of the internal organs, mm -hmm. they were not advanced decom. They were not three weeks out on that floor. Right. They literally were early to moderate, which means probably cut off right around the 10 day mark, which means that they were uh, still alive until January. Mm -hmm. And But you, they want to say, no, well, no, the cops are saying, well, the last time anybody saw them was December 25th. So it was, and I'm like, going, oh my God, shut up. Just shut up, you know, and look and read. Right. But they don't because they want to follow the narrative. Absolutely. And that's all that ever goes over. I'm you know, sorry. This is really starting to piss me off. <laughs> I, these, all these people, I'm, I, I think I've just had it. I've just had it with all of the sheer stupidity and everybody who has condemned this man who was slaughtered in his home and, and they're happy to do it and then hate everybody who wants to defend them. Right. And then hate him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they hate him so much and they hate us so much that they refuse to take the scales off of their eyes to see the actual truth. Right. It's like, answer this. Where are the pools of blood? Because right. they're not on that carpet. Right. right. I mean, it's where the no head either. is laying, there should be a huge pool of blood. But there isn't. You zoom in on that carpet right there in that corner, it is clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's clean and that's that's the huge telltale right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Which at that point it's you're looking at the crime scene is okay, well was there plastic down? Was this even committed there? Um mm -hmm. you know, there's all sorts of different kinds of questions. And then that's where you start getting into some of these um friends statements that which well, I mean, they weren't necessarily out to the public initially. Uh there was discussions with Greg and all this uh between him and Mason Hendricks. And Mason Hendricks is talking about decibels and then talking about the basement. And you keep going around these little rabbit holes. It's like, well, why are you talking about decibels, dude? <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't mentioning things like silencers. Nothing was mentioned because, well, mm -hmm. then you, you know, you're, you're looking for specific things and we're not seeing any traces of that type of activity on that pistol. Doesn't mean it couldn't have been done potentially by another pistol, but, you know, once again, we've got the bullets, so we know which gun that came from, too. So we've got that. But then at the same time, you know, we're not talking about silencers. We're saying, okay, well, why didn't anybody hear this? If this was done in the house, why didn't anybody hear this? And he's bringing up, okay, well, then he's got the basement, and then he's got, oh, there's all sorts of things in the house. And he's trying to go and remain like he's this expert source on this. But it's like, it's like, ah, dude, no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, you're you're making some crap up. Somebody would have heard that. Not to mention, we know that people had heard something going on. Um, at least they'd heard some noises and that were comparable. They would have been comparable. Um, right. Because you've six, got six shots from a forty cal handgun. Yep. Somebody's going to hear something. You're going to hear one, a, one of those at least. Oh my gosh. 
So, I mean, the, the two people, and I, I don't want to bring one of them up, but I have to because well, somebody that's was there that they mentioned in uh, that they had heard a gunshot or, or a couple gunshots. and But they were saying December 19th. Yeah, in the early part of December. That's quite right. too early. Yeah, right. it's quite too early. Exactly. And then you got the other one, which was, um, it was one of the neighbors. He was on, like, I believe he was right behind David's home, like to the, I believe it was to the right, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember the neighbor's last name, but one of the neighbors had heard something that he wasn't sure if it was fireworks or if it was gunshots, but he had heard But something. it was also early in the month as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. So Nobody that's... actually heard the gunshots when they were supposed to have happened. Right. Yeah. And that's a red flag. Right. For me, at least. Absolutely. And on top of that, have you noticed that none of these guys actually answer a question? Like, yeah. straight up answer a question. They dance around it, and then they gaslight you. Right. And then they, they uh, critique you on why you think uh, David is innocent. When oh, you, should just believe yeah. the, you should just believe the narrative. It's like, but, um, why are you believing the narrative? Weren't you guys supposed to be friends? Then they dance around that and they go right back to it. And it's like, oh, oh, that that's cute, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys can't I mean, answer they, us. They were making a movie about conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're the horrible people for asking questions. We should just accept those narratives. Right. And the way that they protect the narrative is a huge red flag. You know, it's like, okay, well, we're no longer making a difference, so we're just going to send other people after you guys. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's unfortunately how it right. goes. You know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, like, my big thing is, is I've gone around now, and I've actually asked people that were in the rise. And speaking on the rise, mm-hmm. then you've also got, you know, Danny August Mason trying to, you know, even – during that whole negotiation period, oh, uh, well, you should just give me the rise. Me and this other guy, um, Robert Hoyt or whatever, which he had nothing to do with Grace Day as far as we knew. Now, he's jumping on board with, with David, and they're, and they're going to go and do the rise. David never really wanted to do it, but yet David's talking about once this releases, there will be some other trailers coming out too. And he's saying that in the Jason Allen emails. So we know that, no... He wasn't going to do that. Hell, hell no. <laughs> He's like, we're going to release this, and this is going to explain some things, uh, kind of just our creative process here, and then we've got this coming out because the contract isn't fulfilled with the May or with uh, the, the, mic, uh, the mics. So he can still release it. That's the other thing I've, I was also going to mention was because he never signed the agreements, he couldn't fully sign it yet. You know, They couldn't have anything stick because Danny August Mason would have been part of it then. David doesn't want him to be part of it. So I think, you know, but honestly, I think was, mm-hmm. Danny August Mason had been written out and the mic said that David didn't need to do that to continue with his contract. So they didn't understand why David was writing Danny August Mason out. It but could have been something Gleason. That makes sense. Right. I mean, I think it was something as he was talking to Gleason for some time, you know, they had that stuff going on. And I think that's Gleason probably they had something written up. Before August, um, I have a feeling it was like, you know, around that July mark, they had something there. Um, it, it, in fact, mm-hmm. I, I'm positive they did. And I think it was something Galeson said, because I think there was some way that David could have been blocked on some things. Some things could have been slowed down. Um, so I think David was just trying to take those extra measures to make sure there was nothing that could get in his way. He could just get this going and there wouldn't be any... Um, any fallout with anything. It was just like, nope, Danny August Mason's out, Mitch Hiles out, therefore this project is mine to go and just get into Hollywood and we'll get this going. Um, they can't claim anything. They can't take me to court for a damn thing. And, you know, the, the mics might say one thing, but when it comes to legal, I mean, are do they necessarily know all the legality of things? Do they know all the loopholes that Danny August Mason could have pulled? And it does appear that Danny August Mason would have tried to pull something. Um, because, I mean, if you look at, like, the first email correspondence he has with David, he basically tells him, um, yeah, you're not in good standing uh, with Grace State, and uh, you did this. This is kind of shady, but uh, I'd like this. And if I'm going to do this, and I would like this, and I would like this, and I would like that. You know, he's just making demands. Uh, this is this is a guy who is, he had something in the works. 
I'm pretty positive he was getting ready to go and he was probably researching. He may not even have a lawyer, even though we know he did have a lawyer. <laughs> um, but he. Yeah, he did. He so had, it's. He one of his best friends is an enter entertainment lawyer. See, that, that's what I'm saying. It's like this guy was. Okay. He was definitely doing some shady stuff in the back. So. I, I think just that, don't understand how he could still have something to hold on to if David had rewritten the entire script. Right. He didn't. And and I think that's why um, David brought it to him and said, hey, you know, you can have the rise because Danny did have stuff to do with the rise, you know, a lot, not just with mm -hmm. the writing, but with everything else. And mm -hmm. so he's like, hey, I'll just give it to you. But you sign off on this other stuff. And the reality was, is I think he was trying to do it, yes, maybe to protect his butt because yeah Danny's that kind of a person where he would try to go after whatever he felt he wanted not what he deserved mm -hmm. and so I think he was trying to protect himself although he didn't need to right. and then what mm -hmm. did he get for it he got stabbed in the back figuratively stabbed in the back yeah yeah <laughs> And that's that's the issue with it is is David saw these things. He saw a lot of it way too late. Um, you know, he wasn't working these things out. At, you know, after meeting him and all this, and really starting to see some of the, little, you know, oh, this guy's just mooching. He's not doing any good. Okay, you know, he's just still he's going and going and going. Um, you know, with this this whole mooch game, you know, here, he didn't instead of just saying, ah, like, you know what, this guy is toxic and I need him out of my life. He's like, no, no. Uh, you know, he even writes in his journal, he's like, you know, either I, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna go and work with me or I'm going to destroy him. And he's not talking like, you know, literally he's going to destroy him. He's just like, look, I, I'm gonna have to go and break this whole thing off. This friendship is not gonna be worth it if he's not willing to work with me here. You know, and even then he was like, he, he was playing, he was trying to play with like highball, right? And he was expect, or um, yeah, he was expecting Danny August Mason to kind of try to, you know, get somewhere in the middle ground and you know he's like no i'm going all the way to the top this i want all of this you're gonna give me this and i think that's where david's like oh crap well i don't need to go and give you any of this and the mike's probably told him this too so it's it comes down to the same thing he's like well uh i'm gonna go and try and work this out with you to make this work so we can have our friendship still i think that's what it really came down to but you know i can't prove that necessarily but Definitely uh, an interesting part. Uh, any more on that topic at all? As if not, we'll let's move on to our final topic. All right. Uh, so this last one here is David had PTSD and once again just snapped. <laughs> oh, there's no proof. And I'm the so only sick thing. Of it. Yeah, the only thing I can say is that. David talks about having some type of a PTSD. I don't think it was diagnosed, though. And it had nothing to do with the actual war and seeing violence. Right. It was from him being held over, being kidnapped, is how he said it was, mm -hmm. and held over. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that quote-unquote PTSD, the feeling he felt was that he knew at any time the military could come back and drag him back off, and he didn't want to. And that's what he wasn't looking forward to. You know, and like we were talking about just the other night, it's like someone with true war PTSD is not going to be doing the trailers that David did. Right. They're not going to be out there firing their weapons like David does and training people on how to do hand-to-hand -hand combat for movie scenes. You don't yeah. do that. Yeah, they're going to be backing off from yeah. that. It's, it's going to be crippling. Yeah. I mean, some of the things that he was doing with his uh, target shooting and going to the range, they literally were reenacting live fire situations. Mm -hmm. And he looked forward to those. So, I mean... If he had PTSD, would he really be looking forward to that? Would he even put himself in that situation? 
Right. Right. There's no way. And, and in the trailer where they're doing those actual, you know, you've got the guys in the, the, the BDUs and, you know, mm-hmm. out there doing actual fire. Fi- well, you know, in the, the thing, firefights going back and forth. Someone with PTSD could not do that. Mm-hmm. It would have sent them off and they would have lost it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, so that's an easy yeah, one to go just... That's an easy one to go and uh, end the show on, of course. <laughs> Is, uh, yeah, he, he was, obviously, he there was no snapping. Obviously, we've already established this. That's not a thing anyways. But he didn't, nothing, really. All these these common things that people have talked about. There Is, is it okay if I kind of take this in a different direction for just a brief moment? Sure. And um, because the, the old snapped thing, and we know by uh, David doesn't have any police records, not one Bingo. accusation of violence. No, ever did he leave a bruise on his wife, nor did he ever beat his child. Um, there's no proof that he was a violent and abusive mm-hmm. person. Now, there are other people associated with this man and this project who have been arrested for domestic violence, domestic abuse, and more than once. Right. And so the police don't look at that. They don't see that there are people close to David and close to the situation who have that abusive background and who had motive, means, motive, and opportunity. And they're not, I mean, I'm not saying they did it. I'm saying, but the police didn't even stop to say, hey, maybe we should in, in question them about you know, some stuff here. It's, it's, it's a little weird, right. but no, they, they go after a man whose record is completely clean. Who's never had one complaint, let alone get arrested and get charged with felony domestic abuse. Absolutely. And, and so this is, that is just mind boggling. Oh, it is. It absolutely is. This you know. is where I think that word came down from up above and basically just said, he's the one who's guilty. We're only looking at him. We don't look at anything else. Yeah. It's the only thing that makes sense. I mean, how could police officers who are seasoned not look at other people and just right. buy people's stories, don't bother to follow up on what they're telling them, mm-hmm. checking the phone records, running all of the DNA. We know that the BCA was not running low on funds. It was the beginning of that year. Right. No, and they specifically and, said, hey, here's a list of things we'd like to do. What do you think? And then they came back with a revised list and said no to some and added one, I think, of something else. There was nothing about if it's within a budget. Right. They yeah, just asked exactly. what done. Yeah. And it's all right there in the emails to and from each other in the BCA data request. It's just some people are too, some people don't want to read it. Right. That's what it comes down to. There's just, uh, there's a lot of reading and and a lot of people that have looked at this and they just want to say David's guilty. And that's all they want to say is David's guilty. Um, They don't care, you know, if they really truly cared um, about the family or about um, the truth, then they would read these things and they'd see very, very clearly that no, this is false. No, this is false. Oh, this is what this actually means here. And they, they weren't, they're not doing that. They don't care to. Excuse me. You know, it's just like the item 57 mm-hmm. and item 57 dash one. If you look at the report, it basically says that it didn't have blood. It tested negative for blood. 57 dash one is just a sample that they took to run DNA. Right. What is DNA, Catherine? Can you explain DNA. to people what DNA is? And here's the thing, DNA is the genetic code of which we are made up of. DNA is contained within the nucleus of a cell. Mm -hmm. Many cells have nucleuses, right? Mm -hmm. We have Mm -hmm. skin cells, we have hair follicles, we have bones, we have teeth, we have all kinds of stuff. And there's blood, but some people only believe what, Sophia? 
I'm being very sarcastic here, William. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all good. It's all good. That blood is the only thing that is being tested. And it's not true. Nuclear DNA covers uh, not just the nuclei that's in the blood cells, but they're also doing skin cells. They're doing bodily fluids. They're doing hair follicles. They're testing bone. Whatever is caught on that swab is what's being tested and showing up if there is any DNA on that swab. Absolutely. So we can't say whether or not for certain, oh yeah, there was blood on such and such item and that's what's popping positive or get this, maybe the safe had stem cells on it. Mm -hmm. Because we know that everything that we read throughout the BCA data requests in the BCA lab report, and even the Apple Valley PD uh, redacted police report on page 23, it states there was no blood found in the master bedroom. And then he goes on to talk about the gun safe. If there was blood found on that gun safe, he would have mentioned it. Absolutely. Exactly. Bingo. But when you look through these reports and you look at the list and stuff like that, it just says a swab, which is a sample swab so that they could run the DNA test. Anything that tested positive for blood, it says apparent blood mm -hmm. before the description. Yep. And, and it's, it it's right there in black and white. So, I mean, but most people, they do not want to look at the report. They don't want to read it. They just want to be spoon-fed information. Right. Just like, well, no, I don't, I'm, it's anyway. Right. But it, it is right there, and it's fun to learn about, too. You 100%. just take one item, and you learn about it. You go through the reports, and you find everything written about it. And that's how I've learned about each of these items that they tested and didn't test. And for me, it's been quite a journey. I like doing stuff like that. I understand that most people don't. There's a lot of people um, that don't. They just, uh, just want to run with the narrative. It's um, sheep mentality, as I like to call it. You know, and that's the thing. It's We need critical thinkers. When looking at a case, you have to be a critical thinker. You got to be open. Um, you can't just take the narrative and run with it and, oh, no, this is true. You know, on top of that, when looking at this case, we're proven is we've already been able to go and go over lots of this case already, most of it already, and show David's not guilty from almost every single angle. And, yeah. you know, that's just from looking at it, just keeping an open mind. Is David guilty or is he, is he, uh, is he innocent? And not one piece is really shown David is guilty. It's all shown either he's innocent or it's impossible for him to have done this, or, which same thing falls under innocence as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. um, you know, or it doesn't make any sense, like with the case based on the crime scene, um, based on what was going on. And I know there's some people out there that will say, well, you know, not everybody's just going to go and, you know, um, they're not going to leave a note every single time, you know, or when they, when they, you know, they decide to go and take their own lives or before they decide to go and kill somebody else. Well, sure. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, there's a buildup, but Camille would have but noticed. But yet at this things. crime scene, there's supposedly three of them, right? Mm -hmm. You've got I know, the writing I know. on the wall, the writing on the notepad, and then a little snippet on the computer. Yeah. Really? And, yeah, that none being, of them make sense? And we're being led to believe that it's, uh, he was, right. that, uh, that uh, Allahu Akbar was a uh, last ditch, like, effort to, like, slam uh, Camille and her, um, uh, her religion. faith yeah it's like uh yeah i don't think so and he when he i mean all of his um well not all but a lot of his posts on facebook were to defend the um people over there the afghanistan the afghani people and pakistani people mm -hmm. you know because he'd been there he saw what they went through so why would he go around slamming his wife and her religion right and if he really hated people um of that, why would of he that, marry a the, Pakistani? Right, exactly. Why would he, you know, why would he be so accepting of the father, of the mother, and all this? Why? 
Yeah. No, he, he loved them all. You know, mm-hmm. and that's that's the part that's really troubling is the fact that it's like, you know, you got his family and his supposed friends, you know, her friends and, uh, you know, some of her family that absolutely are like, you know, gung-ho. Like, yeah, no, this is what happened. David did it. Um, you know, it's it's just disturbing. It's disturbing to see that because these are these are people that once again they're they're refusing to acknowledge that there's something off with this case, and then there's something off with some of the people that David was calling friends, and then there's something off with you know what's going on with this case. Why wasn't this uh, really looked at? You know, they find mold. Why did you know this was something that they uh, they could have easily. Uh, got the whole exact time of death and they didn't, or at least relatively close, and they didn't bother even doing anything on that. You know, but yet, of course, you know, we bring these things up. Well, we got uh, medical records. This would have been something that would have came along with those, the toxicology, all this. This would have been something that came with it. And there's nothing there because they never did the tests. Yeah, and, and so to, you know. talking about, um, <laughs> sorry, go Catherine. Go ahead. Uh, Okay, we're not talking about mold on the outside of the body. We're mm-hmm. talking about the inside. Right. Correct. So I just want to clarify that for those who are listening to us discuss this topic for the first time. Yeah, and, and you know, sometimes I feel like I had just, I'm beating a dead horse, but I, I cannot drive this home hard enough when a body reaches an advanced stage of decomposition, the internal organs are liquefied. Mm -hmm. Um, The skin and stuff, and not to be gross, this is just a reality. It starts to fall off the body. And I'm talking it falls off. Mm -hmm. This is not what you find here at the crime scene. You you find three bodies who are completely intact. Yes, um, uh, Kamel has definitely started the bloating stage. She's not in full bloat but starting, and it looked like little Rania might be, you know, and David might have a little bit of a bloat going on or something, but this is all beginning. So this is all early to moderate decomp. Again, people, um, we know it's more than zero or one days, but it's no more than 10 days that those bodies are on that floor because things are still being able to be sliced. They're getting tissue samples and then put those organs back with the body. Mm-hmm. Think about this. So the entire narrative of them even being dead in the month of December is not true. The Emmy knows that and the police department knows that. But yet what do their reports state? Every single officer goes, um, advanced state of decomposition in an advanced state. And I'm like, no. So they're setting a narrative to begin with, which completely isn't at odds with not only what the um the me says but with what the body show right so yeah why? when it comes oh when it comes to the physical bodies you have to go by what the me states mm-hmm. because she's the expert in this case well and there was a lot of so, things she left out and that kind of bothers me too so why did she do that you know why does she not even mm-hmm. talk about the, the skull pieces, other than the mm-hmm. fact that she found that they articulate well with the remaining portion of the skull. I mean, come on, it is evident that there is something seriously wrong with that piece. You've got straight edges and you have um, you have indentations, you have marks on that skull piece. You see them. You, you can't unsee it once you see it, but yet she doesn't mention it. Why? It's a good question. You know, mm-hmm. that's Good you know, but it's also, I mean, I see, I had a problem with, I mean, I, I get that, you know, that there's, you know, there could have been some circumstance where the ME didn't just go and, you know, the same one, why Lilinsky didn't just go and review all three bodies. You know, she only reviewed, um, uh, I believe it was David and Rania. And then we don't really get any mention anymore about the internal organs than we, like how we did with Lilinsky's um, examination. We just got, mm-hmm. oh, here's, this is what this is, this is what this is. He didn't go ahead and mention anything. So was there mold in Camille's body? Well, we don't there get a, That's a good question. We don't, yeah, we we don't, don't get know. a good answer from that. All we know is, no, there's there's none that they're mentioning. So they yeah, didn't mention it. And when you it. have an ME who takes, what, 
10, 12 hours, 12 hours. Oh, at least 12 hours. Yeah, about 12 hours to show up to the scene. Mm -hmm. And she gets on scene and is there for a total of 45 minutes from the time she walks in the door to the time she walks out for three bodies. And it's only 45 minutes total. And that includes bagging them and getting them on the, the gurney to take them out. That's basically all she was there for. <laughs> If that's what I'm saying. So when you think about, you break that down. You, she first walks in. She probably gets introduced. What's going on? Here they are. So five or ten minutes, five minutes, say, and then okay, and then it takes at least, probably at least ten, fifteen minutes to get them bagged up and out, mm -hmm. out the door, for three of them. Mm -hmm. So you got 15, 20, 25 minutes. She was there for 45, 40, so 20 minutes for three bodies. Right. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah, that's almost yeah, like the narrative was basically... Yeah, it literally was a scoop and run. Right. Yep. It's almost mm -hmm. like the narrative was decided right then and there. Okay, well, yes, we got what we need from it was decided this. before. Yeah, she, they, they already decided, so it's just, you know, come by when you're ready and come pick them up. Mm-hmm. But isn't it supposed to be the ME who makes that decision? Mm-hmm. It's supposed oh, to be it the M, Yeah, it's supposed to be the ME or someone from her office that gets there first to look at that scene and then do the the entire um, scene uh, survey. I can't think of the right word right now. Um, and then once they get done, then they call in the BCA and let them collect their samples. But that, it was all backwards. Police was there, BCA then was there, and then at last comes the ME. Yep, tons and tons of And it should have been in reverse. Yep. That's, yeah, because I have the list right here. And the I mean, we know the police showed up first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the police. And then the police with the BCA. And, yep. the, and mm -hmm. then finally the ME at midnight. Yep. Or 1215 or whatever it was that she decides to show up. And yeah, so there's so many, like you were saying, there's so many things that show us that there was a predetermined narrative. And whatever was decided and what was ever tested and something that they concluded was only there to back up the narrative they came up with. And then that's what they used. And this is how it appears. This is my opinion. Oh, I think it's more than just the way it appears. It, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, this almost looks like that's a fact. Yeah, because she shows up at 1230 with her investigator at 1230. Okay, 1230, they stayed to 115 then, right? Yeah, so 45 minutes there at that time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, so the investigator stayed a little bit longer uh, to 145 in the morning. But um, we do have Cooksley on the scene. But he's running the BCA. He's not an ME. Right. No, yeah, no, he's there helping to collect samples. So there's nobody else with authority from the ME's office no. at that scene. No, there there was. That's what I'm saying. And now they did it completely backward. No one should have been on that scene until after the ME's office was there first. Right. And, you know, and, there wasn't, like, any huge disaster happening in Minnesota to keep them from coming. Correct. Right. Well, and even then, my big thing here, um, and I'm pretty sure I, I got to adjust this um, well, the timeline, but if we're looking at like even 10 days, um, there's some interesting posts or some interesting things that actually occurred around that time. I'm not going to get into it too much or anything, but it just basically we have on the 8th, you have Jason Allen responding back to David's email. That's something David would have responded back to immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at the time on this, when he actually responded to him, David most likely would have responded then and there um, unless he was asleep. So my guess is, <clears throat> just looking at this alone, I mean, if we're just looking at just from that standpoint, then we'd be looking at he'd had to have been dead before that email was there, or yeah, he I'd, died. You know, if you're looking at the the decomp and and the state of the bodies, so somewhere between the third and the seventh, they died. Right. So, but the yeah, and I always have thought the second. I mean, it's a possibility. Also. I mean, it, it, I still believe that's a possibility. I don't think they were at any point in December is when that actually happened. Um, right. It's definitely in January for sure. But it's also some of these calls, like, for instance, Cyprus calling had it been before the 8th. Why? Because they would have answered that. That's for Rania's school. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we're looking definitely before the 8th, and it would have to have been anywhere between the 1st and the 8th. I would argue at least just in that range, but even then looking, you know, beyond that, I would probably argue anywhere between, yeah, probably 3rd and 8th as well. But it's still it's interesting because that email, that's also, that, that gives us a big clue here because... David would have responded that instantly. Um, yeah. Unless, like I said, he was asleep. So, but that's, that's, there's more interesting things along with that, the whole, the day of discovery, plus, you know, the, the timeline up until that point as well. There's just a lot of interesting things, people calling repeatedly. Um, yeah, it's, it's bizarre, but you know, but David didn't do it though. It's it's impossible, literal impossible. I'm still waiting for them to produce the proof, and right. that's all we've ever asked for. I don't. I think Greg has said it till he's blue in the face. In fact, he might be purple now. You know, he's like, <laughs> "Give me the proof. I'll believe you if you show me the proof." And right. there is none. Right, and they and even if they did have the proof, there would be some kind of excuse um, with those said people. Oh well, you know, if you don't if you don't buy the story as is, and you know. There's that, but even if we have the proof, we're not gonna. We don't need to show you because we don't need to prove that to you. Well, we're not saying you need to, but if you're trying I don't to go need... in, if you want to, David is innocent, and yeah. I don't need them to quote unquote prove anything to me. Mm -hmm. So, from well, what I have seen, David is innocent, and they have the same exact stuff that we have. Right. Well, and that's the thing. Anybody can find this stuff. I mean, I was able to find the photos. Um, very, very quickly, just researching, just, okay, well, uh, Crowley family crime scene photos. You can just use that, you know, 2015 Crowley family crime scene photos, and you'll find the, you'll eventually find the photos. It'll lead you to several different locations, um, and you'll be able to get a hold of every single photo, you know, so that says something right there. You can get this, it's readily available. And there's plenty of people out there. They'll research the case, and they just know if David did. David did it, mm -hmm. without a doubt. But you know, once again, we live in America here. So for those that are overseas, he's innocent until proven guilty, and they've yet to still prove that he's guilty. So those that are on that side saying he's guilty, you guys have the burden of proof. So you guys have to be bringing that. We don't have to bring crap. We're saying he's innocent. Yet we're still showing proof that, well, this explains he's innocent. This explains he's innocent. This explains he, he didn't do this. I mean, we've talked about PTSD tonight. We've talked about abuse. We've talked about drug and alcohol um, you know, uh, usage. We've talked about all these things, common areas where people would claim this, this is, he's dead to rights right here. This is, he did it. But we can prove okay, that. Okay, but doubt. there's, there's two things that we didn't discuss. Sure. One was the music that was playing, the music list. Mm -hmm. Because that absolutely proves David guilty. Oh, right. Yeah, that's Starcasm. true. That's, that's true. Forgot about that one. Or, drum roll, please. <laughs> the bloody footprint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Oh, no, we forgot another oh, one. No. We, we also have got another one. Oh, it's David's gun. Oh, ho, ho. his gun, so he had Why to about David's it. gun? Right, exactly. You know, and then you've got uh, the other one was, uh, my favorite was another one that was also brought up um, um, with uh, Mason Hendricks' conversation, which, uh, well, David always did this. This is what he did, so that's how this always operated. Well, that's hearsay. I, I'm sorry, but that doesn't prove anything. It's just hearsay. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Well, I'm going to go back to David's gun really fast mm -hmm. because I've heard some theories that are just flat out wrong in regards <laughs> to his gun and why it proves him guilty. Right. And I'm fairly certain David had this gun since before he went into the military. So he was very familiar with this gun and he trains with it all the time at the gun ranges and stuff like that. He's cleaned it. He knows how to work around this gun. It's, it's nothing new to him. Right. He doesn't need to remove the magazine and put a new one in because there was a jam 
No, you All do you not to do is clear the jam at the top. You yeah. just rack the slide. Is that what it's called? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You rack the slide and it pops out and then make sure a new one's in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's absolutely no reason to remove the magazine. And if he had removed the magazine after cutting his hand from racking the slide, like <laughs> numerous times over and over and over, uh, how many bullets did he fire from that first magazine, number one? Mm -hmm. And why did he continue to shoot six, seven more bullets out of the second magazine? Yeah, that's probably actually how he lost his uh, his right hand, too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, wrecking the slide is just going to take it all off. Yeah, and it's just going to eat it. You know, it's, you know, it's I mean, gone. you would have to be a complete imbecile to take out a magazine to clear a jam. Mm. You don't yeah. do that. <laughs> Especially if you're in a situation, a firing situation where you're doing, you know, a you're actually shooting things and at people. Right. That, you don't drop the magazine. But somebody who is inexperienced would not know that. Bingo. Like I said, or, whoever, whoever did this, they just watched way too much CSI and there's details they didn't pay attention to. Well, and here's the here's how I, in my head, how I see that working out is the person who didn't know the gun thought that the magazine release button was the the turning the safety off Probably. so they pushed it thinking they're turning the safety off and instead they released the magazine i think that's oh, that's yeah. a pretty, had to pretty take solid it, right put it back in which would explain why there's the bloody yeah yeah because yeah. their hands you know they got the the blood or whatever and then it hit, drops they push it it hits the floor they have to pick it up now with a bloody hand and put it back in Mm -hmm. That's just how I envision this happening because it's the only thing that makes sense to my brain. No, I mean, that seems, we also that seems pretty have solid. to explain David's blood because well, they had the, the blood, they had marketing. Blood yeah, exactly. Because there's no injuries besides the head apparent head wound. You know, he probably did that so, after you know he shot himself in the head. Apparently, yeah, he, had, he you know, accidentally that's released right. his he magazine. Got, yeah, he got the blood when he cut his scalp off. You know, those straight edges. I mean, they're straight and sharp angles on that skin piece. I'm sorry. <laughs> so he took a sharp instrument and cut that off, and that's how he got the blood in his hand, and then he was messing with his gun. You're yeah. right, William. Yeah, he, he, totally, he totally scalped himself right. and everything. That, and then paleo helped before him. Or, yeah. Was that before or after his corpse moved on its own <laughs> during the <laughs> process? After. From the recliner to that position in the middle of the rug. Yeah, as far as we know, he was sitting. His dead body was sitting in the chair and decided to get up and move, do a little jig, oh and then gosh. fell over. You know? I, I was laughing so hard. I had I, I was talking to Sophia. I was laughing. Oh, my gosh. I literally was laughing my ass off when this was brought to my attention. Uh -huh. where somebody said, well, the, the corpse move after death. And I'm, like, going... <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, a body will contract right. and relax during rigor. So, yes, is there movement? Yes. It doesn't get up and fucking move two feet, okay? <laughs> it doesn't twist positions. I'm like, oh my God, what an this idiot. Is, <laughs> right. This is during that live stream that we were doing on Wednesday where this Sorry, person was contradicting. Yeah, they were contradicting themselves because they were saying, well, the body moves. And then when Catherine's talking about the hands and the fingers on David, uh, that person is like, well, no, you can't move those because they're stiff. <laughs> Oh, oh, they'll oh, turn geez. to, no, they'll, they'll crumble if you move <laughs> them. And I'm like, no, they don't. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, my gosh. That's I got ridiculous. me with so even. <laughs> They're able to move mummies. <laughs> they can adjust some of their bodies, but that's not the point. The point is that this person has no clue what they're talking about, and yet they're talking with authority. And if you don't listen to them, they start screaming and threatening. Oh, so yeah, and like, doxing and all sorts of other things. <laughs> so, it's ridiculous. It's a child. Yeah, that's 
Yeah. That's what children Nobody do. Nobody pays attention to that. Well, I mean, some people do, and I don't understand why. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's... it's Not a whole lot, though. Yeah, exactly. You know, but, um, you know, that's the thing. It's just, you know, somebody that's going to be loud and obnoxious about something, that's fine. But read the documents, please. Come at us with facts. Please come at us with science. These are things you need to go and bring to the table or else hearsay is just going to be just dismissed. Nobody's going to care about hearsay. It's a hearsay. But we need to be going over things that are fact, you know, uh, math, science, um, anything that can be helpful in this case. Yeah, bring it. You know, if you really think David's guilty, then yeah, bring it. You know, we'd love to see this. Um, but bring proof. Don't just bring hearsay. You bring hearsay, that's when people just mute you and block you and all this. They're tired of hearing about it. People want to hear, you know, okay, well, if David's guilty, what makes him guilty? There's nothing. <laughs> that's just the easy answer there. There's nothing there. David is absolutely everything that, Yeah, everything that we've mentioned has been assumptions. Mm -hmm. Assumptions by other people who did not know what actually happened. Yep. The police don't know what happened. They admit that. Mm -hmm. The ECU absolutely doesn't know what happened, but somebody created a fake document mm -hmm. to try to pass it off as they did know. Right. To bolster their claim that David was guilty, which is not going to be good for them in the future. Yep. Once it's found out who did that, that's going to be, it's going to be a lot of trouble right there. Is that's uh, that's forging mm -hmm. a document, especially a uh, legal document, and yeah, good luck on that one. Whoever did that, you know. There's I, actually a couple things that are being passed around that have the same quality as that, aka legal document, mm -hmm. and uh, that's all been sent off to Apple Valley to be verified. And oh, I'm really? sure I will hear back because. If it's a fake document or another one, then they will do another affidavit. Mm -hmm. So, oh, now I'm curious as to what this is. <laughs> and I don't email things to them. I send it certified mail, so right. that they have to acknowledge that they have received the information. Right. Emails are too easy to ignore. Absolutely. Can't blame you. So, well, yep. that that is uh, the the close of the show. Fortunately, is uh, I do start my new work schedule tomorrow. So, so where can Thanks people for find having me on? Of I appreciate course, it. of course, anytime, anytime. Yeah. And uh, so, where where can uh, the audience find your guys' uh, content at exactly? Just giving the floor and the mic to you guys right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm on YouTube. It's just under Catherine Michelle. There are a lot of us, though, but mine is like a, a blue picture. <laughs> it's a, like a photo with a, a, a blue filter on it. Um, but you'll it, just look up Catherine Michelle, David Crowley or something. You'll be able to find me there. And also our group. You want to tell them where the group is? Sophia? It's on Facebook. Facebook, excuse me. And it's titled um, Justice for David Crowley and Family. And uh, there is a website that is uh, being run by our admin, uh, Greg Fernandez Jr. And that is the gray stage um, dot wordpress dot com. com. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could go there for all of the documents, all of the photos, all of our podcasts, and links to YouTube. So it's a great resource. Absolutely. And for those listening who need an actual link, I'm sure Will can hook you up. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys once again for, uh, for joining me. And uh, we will be back next weekend. I think I should be able to have some more stuff out for the gray state stuff. So, uh, but thank you guys for tuning in, and we will see you guys next weekend.
interested in the paranormal? Murder mysteries. Cryptocurrency and thought-provoking interviews. Then check out Crypt Rick's I've Been Thinking on YouTube. Or every Monday night at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Studio A at Revolution Radio. Freedomslips.com Welcome to the Crypt. <laughs> Murder at 1051 Ramsdell Drive. What happened to David Crowley, his wife, and his daughter? If this was truly a double murder suicide, why did investigators fail to prove David Crowley guilty? Where is the evidence David Crowley killed his wife and daughter? Where is the evidence David Crowley killed himself? Within 24 hours of finding the bodies of David, Kamel, and Rania Crowley, the Apple Valley Police Department were treating the incident as a double murder suicide. Authorities cannot prove David wrote Allahu Akbar in his wife's blood on the living room wall. Authorities cannot prove David wrote I have loved you all with all of my heart on a laptop in the kitchen. Authorities cannot prove David wrote Open the Rise most recent version Submit to Allah Now on a notepad in his office bedroom. Authorities cannot prove the dog trapped inside the house ate David's right hand, both of Kamel's hands, and their daughter's right arm, since dog feces tests were never done. Authorities did not know about a bullet that rolled out of a living room carpet until they were notified by the cleaning company, two days after the bodies were found. That bullet would later be tied to Rania Crowley. Authorities did not see the bullet hole in the living room ceiling or the bullet in the attic above until they questioned David's friend a month after the bodies were found. Authorities did not find a motive to support their accusations against David Crowley. Authorities did not find David's blood on any of the bullets at the crime scene. Authorities do not know when David, Kamel, and Rania Crowley died. What we know for sure is that David Crowley has not been proven guilty. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Ross from Planet X Filmworks channel on YouTube and the Zodiac Files True Crime series. Check it out and shout out to Greg and the Gray Stage channel. Their content is amazing. everyone this is Sophia from the gray stage podcast and I'd like to invite all of our listeners to join the justice for David Crowley and family group located on Facebook where we have almost 4,000 members in this group we welcome discussions regarding the case and have all of the documents located in the files section for everyone to review if you like, you're welcome to visit Greg Fernandez Jr.'s website called The Gray Stage. It's located at thegraystagewordpress.com. You can find his book and all the official documents for this case at his website. Lastly, I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Michelle, who's a part of this podcast. Catherine Michelle has a YouTube channel under her name where she mainly discusses the Crowley case. So please feel free to stop by and give her channel a like and a listen. Until our next podcast, keep seeking the truth and justice for David Crowley and his family.
George Orwell once said that in a time of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Oh, how those words were only whispered when he first said it. But it's a trumpet blaring through a megaphone today. So are you ready to take a journey down a labyrinth of twists, turns, and dead ends as we seek out Wonderland? Join me every weekend for investigative live streams at twitch.tv backslash strange investigations. Interested in more organized and detailed content about the hard truths of the world? Then check out my content on YouTube by searching out William Rail or Strange Investigations. On Rumble, Bit Shoot and Odyssey by searching Strange Investigations. Lastly, the quick and easily digestible content is more your speed. You just can't get enough of my content. Check out my content on TikTok at Strange Investigations One. A simple truth. It really is this simple. Either you believe David Crowley is innocent or you believe he is guilty. If you believe David Crowley is guilty, you are wrong. If you believe David Crowley is innocent, you are right. It really is that simple. A United States Army veteran is dead. His wife and his five-year-old daughter are dead. A thorough investigation would only conclude with authorities admitting they lacked evidence to support their accusations. If authorities were to admit the case remains unsolved, they would also have to admit that the public may still be in danger. I am not able to solve this case. My interest is in forcing authorities to admit David Crowley is innocent. The reason they refuse to talk about this case is not because they are confident of David's guilt. They lack confidence in their allegations. Their department wishes to move on, but they are only lying to themselves. They must know the simple truth, and they need to publicly admit this. Their credibility depends on it now. The unspoken truth is that David is innocent until proven guilty. Why are authorities running from the simple truth? How long do they think they can run for? You cannot run from God, you cannot run from your nightmares, and you cannot run from the facts. Why would anyone want to? What could possibly motivate someone to try? If you cannot prove David Crowley guilty, then he remains innocent. It's as simple as that. So the resistance we face is disgusting. If David was guilty, the evidence would be right in our faces. If David was guilty, resistance to our questions would not exist. If David was guilty, facts would be evident. There are no facts to prove David guilty. There are only facts which prove David innocent. Hence the resistance to getting justice for David Crowley family. Who cares? Do the people who closed this case and decided to not speak about it ever again really care? Do the friends who accused David Crowley of being guilty days after his body was found really care? Perhaps they only care about spreading the accusations of David's guilt instead of researching the facts of this case. They don't seem to care about the facts which prove David innocent. Truth is a simple thing. Justice does not die. Facts prove David is innocent.